Good morning, Your Excellency, and welcome to this sitting of the State of Deliberation. States of the island of Guernsey, I hereby give notice that a meeting of the States of Deliberation will be held at the Royal Courthouse on Wednesday, the 4th of November 2020, at 9.30 a.m., to consider the items listed in this BA Dutar, which have been submitted for debate. And BA Dutar 24 is, con is convened pursuant to the provisions of Rule 24 of the Rules of Procedure. Members of the States, I have been forewarned that Deputy Cameron is anticipating, uh, and perhaps we can just mark that as uh, his reason for non-attendance. Before we turn to the business of this meeting, Members of the States, a little bit of unscheduled business, which is uh, the fact that I have received representations, as was apparent uh, during the course of the election meetings from the Civil Contingencies Authority, uh, relating to the possibility of authorised absences from meetings of the States of Deliberation, which mean that a member who has an authorised absence can arrange for their vote to be cast uh, in accordance with Rule 26.3a by another member, uh, a proxy vote. Proxy votes may only be cast in accordance with Rule 26.4 on original propositions, but excluding any proposition from the presiding officer, secondary propositions and amended propositions. Now, all members will, I am sure, be uh, aware of the importance for the whole community of adhering to public health guidance in relation to the ongoing pandemic. And the recommendation
recommendations of public health, uh, the strong recommendations are that people who are unwell stay at home and do not attend work or gatherings. And this is a form of gathering, uh, a pleasurable form of gathering, of course. And the worsening situation elsewhere, and possibly also uh, domestically from time to time uh, with people coming into the island, means that everyone has to be responsible for taking the right decision as to whether they should congregate with others uh, and in particular the recommendation to me has been that elected members of the states should not attend state meetings in person if they dis display symptoms which are consistent with a respiratory tract infection including cold or flu-like symptoms. So, with the winter months coming, what we thought I would do now that we're in a, a phase where proxy voting can potentially be available is to indicate to all of you that there will be an authorised absence from a meeting of the states of deliberation in accordance with paragraph 3A of Rule 26 if that non-attendance of a member uh, arises from complying with public health guidance. Um, it's only in relation to COVID-related reasons, it's not for any other reason. So if somebody is an dispose for a reason aside from that because they are poorly in another um, situation and, and Deputy Cameron's absence this morning is, is, is something that I was aware of but it wouldn't be covered by this authorised absence. And the arrangements for securing a proxy vote will be to notify the presiding officer uh, through an email to the state's greffier of a request that a named other member be able to cast a proxy vote uh, on behalf of that member and the person who is to cast the proxy vote must confirm that they have been so asked and are ready and willing and able to do so and a response will be given to the two members, the one who is requesting the proxy vote and the person who will be voting by way of proxy on behalf of the other member and then that will be uh, and that will be able to be cast uh, thereafter during the course of that meeting. So that is the arrangements for an authorised absence. I'm delighted to see all of you here. But if any of you do display those symptoms uh, during the course of the meeting, by all means disappear. Uh, please do actually. And if you, <laughs> and, and if you display those symptoms in the run up to a meeting and you contact the uh, the presiding an officer through the state's graphia as I've just described, then we'll put in place the ability for that proxy vote to be cast in accordance with Rule 26.3a. So I hope that's uh, sufficiently clear. If it's not, uh, we'll set it out for you in due course uh, when, uh, when we have a moment. So the first item of business for today's meeting, members of the states, will be a statement on behalf of the Committee for Economic Development by its president on general aviation matters, and therefore I turn to Deputy Indy. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the, re the request for this statement came from a member of the Assembly after they read a story in the Guernsey Press and I thank him for raising it with me and other members so that, I can, so that I can address this appropriately here today. Members will be aware that many commercial, legal and operational matters that support government in Guernsey do often need to be addressed with proportionate confidentiality before the Assembly is directly involved. Sir, Mr Dominic Lazarus remains the Director of Civil Aviation and the office in Guernsey is currently being supported by Mr Ash Nicholas as his deputy and supported by a small team that supports them. The States of Guernsey does not comment on individual employment matters. The airport continues to meet all of the necessary safety and security requirements that are needed and it is fully operational, albeit within the constraints of the travel restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure that all members of the states will join me in thanking staff at the airport and harbours who have kept the essential services running. They are doing a fantastic job. So, while I am mentioning aviation matters, I would like to pick up on an issue about the state support for the Office of the Director of Civil Aviation so it can allow the continued growth of the aircraft registry. The member requesting this statement has also asked for an update on that. 
Members may know that the aircraft registry operates independently, but with statutory oversight from the Office of the Director of Civil Aviation. Yes, I know it gets complicated. The aircraft registry, or 2REG, as it is branded, has been successful in registering hundreds of aircraft from all around the world and currently has 267 aircraft on its register. It returned over £375,000 in royalty payments in 2019 and despite 2020 being an unusual year, the States is still likely to receive royalty payments of around £250,000. As well as this, sir, members, a small group representing legal offices, corporate service providers and aircraft operating companies in Guernsey estimate that their business derive in excess of £1.4 million pounds per annum through two reg and related work only. That is upwards of 1.4 million pounds per annum back into the local economy. On top of this, the operation is based in the island, so Guernsey benefits from the income tax stake on several members of two reg staff as well as rent paid for dedicated offices in the airport building. Finally, sir, two reg provides an opportunity for growth of the general and commercial aviation sectors as we seek to drive economic recovery. In short, it is good for our economy and good for our reputation as a place to do business. Indeed, it cannot be seen as anything other than a very successful business in Guernsey. The operation does require a little more financial support from the States for 2021 in the form of additional resources employed by the Office and the Director of Civil Aviation, a total of £103,000. This is needed to assist with the statutory functions of the Director of Civil Aviation in determining applications for the registration of aircraft from 2REG. This makes sure that those aircraft being put forward for registration by 2REG meet the necessary standards to maintain safety as well as Guernsey's reputation. The committee is aware that the previous Policy and Resources Committee did challenge this request for a small amount of additional funding for the office. Um, though on the basis of a further business case prepared by officers, with the support of the business community, it eventually conceded. So I'm pleased to report that the additional amount has now been approved and rightly so. Uh, why would we not want to support such a positive business for Guernsey? The committee will support it and we will seek to grow general commercial aviation to support our economic recovery. Thank you, sir. Members of the States, there's now a period of up to 15 minutes which may be extended for questions to be asked within the context of that statement. Does any member have a question for Deputy Indy? Yes, Deputy Carroll. Sir, during question time of the candidates for the presidency of the Economic Development Committee, I asked the question, did the candidates agree with the the permit for the white van man needed to be introduced here in the island? But I was extremely disappointed. The deputy in the said he didn't see it as a priority because it wasn't a major issue. I'd like to ask him if, if he has discussed the issue with his committee, and if he has, what was the outcome? Um, and if he hasn't discussed the issue with his committee, is he able to give me an assurance, please, anyone? Deputy Carapar, I'm not persuaded that that's a question in the context of the statement. It may be a perfectly valid question to ask the President of the committee when he delivers his general update statement, and perhaps we can leave it for that. Any other? Deputy Gollop. Thank you, sir. Whilst accepting that it is not wise to, to explore, as the President has said, any matters pertaining to employment, I would like to ask uh, Deputy Inder whether they have plans to appoint a second deputy to assist Mr Nichols in the unlikely but possible eventuality of Mr Nichols not being available to do the work, the important work that he is specified to perform. Mr. Nicholas, Deputy Governor, yes, Deputy Okay. 
Well, sir, um, it's interesting that has outlined some, some of the benefits from the uh, Mackenzie Registry, but it's quite clear that the role of um, two edge has changed um, actually quite substantially from the original proposals that were brought to the states a number of years ago. Um, and, and given the, the additional budget that, uh, that uh, Deputy Newman referred to, um, will he perhaps give an undertaking on behalf of his committee in, in view of that and in view of the change role of the, the, the two edge uh, that will say within three months a cost benefit analysis of the aircraft registry to the jurisdiction will be brought um, to uh, for the benefit of members to have sight of that. Deputy yeah, Minister to reply. Um, I don't think I'm on the 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 Deputy Sam Pierre. Um, so, notwithstanding the understandable uh, the need for confidentiality, which uh, Deputy Neil referred to in relation to the position of the Director of Civil Aviation, um, and perhaps some of the issues caused by the general election, um, nonetheless, will the President be undertaking that he will at least seek to ensure that members are kept uh, confidentially briefed or, uh, as appropriate, um, so that actually they are not finding things out about the Director of Civil Aviation through the media. Deputy Ender. My perspective is that we go from the reason for his address. It's as simple as that. And I was talking to the Secretary when he does not consider the individual important matters from the branch, saying, um, discussing any broader issues with the government of membership. This broad has been out of the meeting, I believe, it was later. Deputy Zaman. So thank you. Uh, given the uh, situation with the uh, Director of uh, Civil Aviation, can the President give assurance uh, that the marketing and growth of Two Edge will not be interrupted in any way? To reply. Um, from, from the Minister of Press, I've already explained that this dominant matter remains the Director of Civil Aviation, if um, a multi unit is currently being supported by Mr. Ashley Pierce and his deputy, and supported by a small team, the support centre of State of Pierce does not comment on individual dominant matters. Um, so, in fact, at the moment, everything is steady as it should go. I don't see anyone else rising to pose a question in the context of that statement. We'll move on to the next statement, which is the general update statement on behalf of the Pro Policy and Resources Committee from the President. I invite Deputy Fairbrush to deliver it. Deputy uh, I'm grateful for that, sir. So I've alluded to time. There'll be much more to say when time and circumstances permit. What I can say is that with a collaborative, cogent, and purposeful state, as much can be achieved in the next four years and eight months. What I can also say is that policy and resources intends to operate in a collaborative and transparent way throughout the whole of this term. There's been much talk about visions and strategies. My remarks are not to be are meant to be dismissive in any of that. The vision, though, of this Policy and Resources Committee, and we believe with this space, is action that is getting things done. My colleague, Deputy Hellyer, pointed out to me as recently as Friday afternoon that the PR Committee shows us having 406 pending action points. That's ridiculous. That's unachievable. That's spending resources, money, and effort far too thin. We thus intend to concentrate on key issues and achievable objectives. Before I turn to that, let me say what we intend to do to be transparent. We intend to hold week, uh, monthly meetings with the presence of various states. Committees. We intend to ask the presidents to come with three key aims that they would wish to see achieved and fully effected in the state's term. We will also seek to break down any barriers. For example, if something is strictly within the mandate of the PNR, but other committees or presidents have contributions to make, they're welcome. Equally, we do not expect them to be, and in fact, are confident that they will not be territorial in respect of their own mandates. We as a committee also intend to be open to the public. We intend to have periodic open meetings with the public. We would seek to have the next meetings every six months or if there's something more urgent more regularly. We would hope to have our first meeting, and it may be a drop-in sometime before Christmas. We also appreciate that not everybody in a committee can do everything. 
I'm very fortunate that I have four able colleagues in whom I repose complete confidence. There are issues that we want to address in three months, six months, one year, and throughout the term. Some matters will have to be able to be and will be able to be addressed more quickly than others. One of the key issues of prime importance is that of civil service reform and transformation. That will be led at a political level by the Vice President, Deputy Chief Minister Deputy Salisbury. She will revert, revert back to the state for the state in three months' time. Now, we're not saying in relation to that issue or any of the others that I mentioned that we'd all be able to achieve in the prescribed period. What we can say with absolute conviction is that we will get on with things and meet deadlines. We will suffer no procrastination. So reverting to that particular issue, Deputy Salisbury has taken the lead and in three months' time and periodically thereafter until the issue is resolved, she will come back to the states and inform the states and run into the bailiwick what progress has been made. It is our without intent to achieve civil service reform and transformation. She will also lead and do the contact with the Rosanes. We want to empower the Rosanes and value their contribution. Again, in three months' time, period thereafter, Deputy Salisbury will report back to the States. We still have substantial funds available from the bond. We want to use those in a proactive and sensible way. Those monies have all the States of Guernsey. We believe that medical tourism, once our border is open, is something we should uh, hope to give significant financial contributions to the public of Guernsey. That would undoubtedly involve capital expenditure. That may involve a change of rules by the states as to how the bonds can be used. It's a matter that's been talked about in the past, but now needs to move forward. Deputy Latoc will lead on that and again will revert to the states in three months' time. Also, whilst mentioning him, he will continue to be our lead on external relations. One thing, though, that he and I will do together is to liaise closely with Jersey and the Isle of Man to see where we can save costs, create synergies, and pool resources. In practical terms, that's more likely to be orientated towards our colleagues in Jersey. But we don't exclude any such opportunities in the Isle of Man. Again, there will be periodic reports. The state is the largest employer in the island. The employment terms and conditions uh, and the representations in respect thereof are cumbersome, bureaucratic, duplicative, and inefficient. They need to be recognised. Deputy Mahoney will lead on that, and again, we will, will periodically revert to the states. The first such statement being made in three months. He will also lead in relation to state property. The state has much property, it's all, some of it's not well utilised, it needs to be rationalised. There needs to be a political lead to take that forward, and Deputy Mahoney will be that person. What we intend to do, and again in three months, is draw up a list of practical capital projects that could be advanced in early course. We will be careful not to overheat the construction industry. At the moment, we know it's very difficult to get a tradesperson, but that will pass, and there are very few long term building contracts which will sustain our construction industry going forward. We will come back with a capital program that could well include methods that are already uh, included in the capital program, which, which may need to be accelerated, such as Hamlet Slip, Fermat, Rule Council, and Steps, just to name a few. We will have a lawful emphasis in favour of Guernsey businesses. We want the work to be carried out by Guernsey companies and a Guernsey work workforce and for that money to be cited in our economy. Our main industry is out of the finance sector, which has rightly been said to compose so very many disparate and independent units. We have great confidence in Guernsey finance, and despite it being so well led, it has been under finance for a considerable period of time. We will liaise with it said and report back in January with proposals as to how we can assist in tracking the business of the island and continue to work with the the Guernsey Financial Services Commission to ensure we bring good business to the island. Now, I've now been back in the island for about 40 years or so. I was surprised when I came back how inadequate and old-fashioned our insolvency and bankruptcy laws were then. There's been no improvement in the last 40 years. There will be now. Deputy Helly will take control of that and will report back again within three months with concrete proposals. That's, this is both an aid to the finance sector and those individuals in our society who have been struggling with financial debt which is unmanageable. I should have also said that Deputy Hellyer will be the lead in relation to Guernsey Finance and indeed the finance sector generally. And also importantly, he will lead on our relationship with our uh, cousins and friends in Albany and Saar. We will announce in other initiatives in due course, but there's one I can announce now. We will seek to establish a Guernsey investment body, or such other suitable terminology, which will be focused, focused on implementing a sovereign wealth fund approach to our various investment portfolios. In the first instance, we will ask as a subcommittee or body appointed by PNR, Deputy St. Pierre to share the same. He will have such resources as he needs. The idea will be to create an investment authority. I'm very grateful to him, and he's already indicated that he's willing to take on and lead that task. Indeed, it's a 
waste of his talents not to use the same form. It's like having Gareth Bale on the substitute bench and not calling him on. Deputy St. Pierre has confirmed that he believes that he could bring something positive back to the States in the next three months. This could be a real game changer. It could be something that will stand us uh, and available in good stead for 50 years. Deputy Henry is going to be very busy because he's also agreed to lead. I'm sure he will do so in a purposeful way. The considerations for the development enhancements of Eastern Seafront. Affordable housing has been difficult in this island for so many years. Also, town needs to be revitalised. There are too many empty spaces above shops where people could live. We need to engage with the Development and Planning Authority. We need to consider developments of places such as Lewis Yard and others. In our view, the leader in respect of that should be the Guernsey Housing Association. We will be making early contact with its able chief executive. Again, we will call back to the states as soon as possible. Uh, we will engage with the and Social Security. I will take PNR's lead on that. We are also going to address the open market in a constructive way. We value it. We will propose us to repeal, amend or change some of the restrictions that we have been put in that sector recently. Again, the concrete proposals will go back to the states in the next two to three months. We also need an up-to-date air and sea connectivity strategy. I will lead on that and I will be in active discussions with the President of Economic Development and the SDSB. Again, I will come back to the states with a uh, report in three months. I will also be leading and it is overlapped with the previous matter in respect of new, new tourist accommodation strategy. There are too many hotels. There are too many unused empty hotels, I should say. There are too many unused hotels that are never going to return to the industry. I understand economic development is accelerating an accommodation strategy that will support this. We will therefore work closely with the president of that committee and the DPA. We need practical action. I will take the lead on that from PNR and revert back to the states in the next three months. We also need to give other assistance to opening up the economy. We will be looking at any unnecessary regulation. We will be seeking an urgent review of the population management regime. I will from PNR lead on that. I'll liaison with the Committee President of Home Affairs. Again, I'll report back promptly. I've not left digital to the end on purpose. What we can do in relation to broadband and the digital industry and beyond is very important. We'll be setting out a broadband working group and again reverting to the states in the first quarter of next year and that again will be headed by Deputy Hellier and he'll be able to with the President of Economic Development. We also need to get our laws enacted I from start to finish much more quickly than previously. We will be seeking to have all the Senate given by His Excellency uh, on the majority of our projects. This will be led by Deputy to talk and again we'll fall back uh, on a timely basis. We'll be seeking a review of the energy structure of, of government. That will be led again by the Vice President, Deputy Salisbury. Here we're seeking uh, evolution, not revolution. We're seeking to make the government more effective. Again, she will fall back promptly. There are matters that we intend to address, and we will, as I say, be open and transparent and speaking regularly to this assembly and the people of the Bay of it. If I've omitted topics and of undoubted importance, that does not mean they will not be considered. This is our starting point. We want to achieve things. Like the clue says, said, all of that said, we will be financially prudent. We will ensure our borders are safe. We will protect the people of the Bay of it and seek to enhance and improve the quality of their life. Thank you very much. My members of the States, the Opportunity arises now for a period of not exceeding 20 minutes, although we're having fun that can be extended at my discretion, um, to ask questions of the President on any matter within the mandate of the committee. So this is different this time. It's not within the context of the statement. It's within the mandate of the committee. You, you've had a flavour of that when doing the elections for presidential uh, candidates. Uh, and the only caveat that I will mention is that when a member asks a question, uh, the president can decline to answer it if, in his or her opinion, his opinion here, uh, any answer might be inaccurate or misleading, in which case there will usually be a written response uh, provided thereafter. So we've got up to 20 minutes of questions uh, to the president. Deputy Gallup. Um, the President has outlined numerous um, strong work streams that, that are perhaps additional to what was the previous uh, position of the committee, uh, but he also identified was it 407 uh, work streams. Which work streams are going to be abandoned given the extraordinary breadth of the work that the new committee is going to undertake? I should have said that the questions have to be no longer than a minute. And replies have to be no longer than a minute and a half and if you're going to be listing 400 <laughs> particular work streams it might take a while. Eh? But deputy, deputy Fairbrush to reply. I can reply in a few seconds sir. I'm not going to go through and say 375 are going to be abandoned because that would be the subject of due consideration. What I have said and what I repeat is that there are too many uh, and we're going to have to concentrate on the key issues. 
Deputy Kazan Sayyidun Miller. Thank you, sir. Um, throughout the election and uh, and also in, uh, in I believe in the opening speeches as well of the, of, of the Chief Minister, we, we do talk about um, energy transition and the climate action plans as being an opportunity to invest in the green and potentially blue economies. Um, in, in the update, uh, Chief Minister has mentioned uh, uh, priorities in that space. I uh, would like to clarify whether that is not a priority any longer if you're using that are thinking. That's a very fair question. I only had 10 minutes, so I wanted to say certain things. But uh, what the deputy raises, and I'm not going to try to pronounce her name, I'll get used to it eventually, I'm sure she'll apologize to so her for five or six times I'll get it wrong, is absolutely right. Those are really our considerations. We'll also be liaising with our other colleagues on other committees in relation to such matters. But the point she makes is, is clear. She's pushing it here, so. Welcome, Representative Smith. Thank you, sir. Could I just ask if there's any updates with the PSO regarding the Albany Air Links? Thank you. Are there any updates in the PSO regarding the Albany routes? Yes, sir. Thank you for your question. Yes, there are. Uh, I'm grateful to all the representatives. So, uh, PNR has recently written to Orly in the last week or so. Uh, and we believe, I can't say we've had a response yet, and I don't, I'm not implying any uh, a reasonable delay on their part, I hate to add, that uh, if that's accepted, that will resolve the issue. Uh, all I can say at the moment is we've sent a letter to them. They've got a brand new chief executive uh, who I think started work this week. We do expect a reply back soon. Deputy Dyke. Um, could, could I ask if Deputy Fairbush's committee will be considering shortly a partial hiring freeze on the civil service? Deputy Fairbush? I've already said that Deputy uh, Salisbury, in whom I have absolute confidence, uh, I'll not just say that because she said something different to my name, uh, is uh, we'll be looking at all issues of civil service uh, reform and transformation. Now, that's not going to be, so we're not coming back next week and saying, and I want to give comfort to anybody because I think our civil service have worked extremely diligently over the last eight or nine months. I don't think they've been working before, but they've been a productive significant pressure in the last eight or nine months. Uh, but that'll be an issue that will be addressed, and that just shows we will report back. Um, so, in order to better enable the dis discharge of the mandates of the committee, um, as certainly, of course, um, Deputy Fairbrush understandably undertook to cease all work, paid and unpaid, with Fairbrush and Farrell, with effect from Monday the 19th of October, can he confirm that he has no done so? If not, why not? And when will he do so? I didn't understand. Would you have ceased all work paid one paid with that much and that? How does that relate, Deputy Sampier, to the mandate of the committee? To better enable the discharge of the mandate, sir. So that was an undertaking given to the Right. Deputy Fairbrush, are you minded to answer that question? Yes, I am, sir. Because at that point, the only thing with my statement saying that the only transparent and say I'm not going to answer something, the only reason I won't answer something is either legally I can't or I don't know the answer. I know the answer to that. I will still be a consultant at that firm. Uh, I intend to do very little work. I've already withdrawn from the majority of the work that I do at that firm. If I hadn't, I'd have been in a court or a tribunal for 14 days of this month. I would not be in a court or tribunal for 14 seconds of this month unless there's an actual emergency, which I doubt. Deputy Burford. Thank you, sir. With respect to planning change of use, such as moving disused hotels out of the sector, does PNR see value in considering the concept of planning gain, whereby part of the windfalls occasioned by such change of use could be collected for the benefit of the community to be used in projects such as social housing? Deputy Fairbrush. I do indeed, sir. I think that's an excellent question. I'm grateful that Deputy Burford has asked it. That's been my view for a long time, long before I uh, took on this role, was elected to this role. Uh, and that's the way it should be. There should be planning days so that you can get rid of properties in various sectors and do something else for the benefit of the community. That's it, so, every PNR committee takes decisions on matters that may not conform to the desires, welfare, quality of life of the people of Guernsey. Will the President um, confirm that the new PNR uh, will um, consider and 
look at measures taken in the last term which have had a negative impact on the growth and the need of the citizens of this island. Thank you for the question. Uh, I can answer that in very few words, indeed we Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you very much for the statement referred to being for some practical capital projects. Um, could you perhaps advise when it would be intended to next update the state's more general on the state's mental health portfolio? I would have to be aged with my colleagues, but I would anticipate it should be in three months' time. If it could be before, then we will. But I would have thought we can have a lot to do in three months' time because I've been probably going to do eight months of statements. But with the need of uh, the presiding officer, we might get a, a bit of an extension of time in relation to that. I don't mean in relation to the three months, I mean the time that we speak, uh, but in three months. Deputy Collar. Uh, Deputy uh, Miller referred to uh, environment, environmental sustainability. In the speech we've had outlined, we haven't heard much about social policy coordination or promotion beyond housing. Is that an, is that an important part interlinked with the economy of the, of the new committee's thinking? Deputy Fergus. Yes, it is. One of the things I mentioned was affordable housing, which I think one of the things people need uh, if you want a good life is, is a decent home. Uh, now, I don't even buy that home, but we've got a high percentage of people in Guernsey even now. Uh, and we've got a runaway housing market at the moment, as we've all seen with prices going through the roof and conveyances uh, uh, in uh, hundreds at the moment. Uh, but yes, uh, we intend to liaise closely with our colleague, uh, Deputy Rothy, uh, on all such matters. Deputy Trot. Thank you, sir. <coughs> so, Deputy Fairbrush, in his very upbeat um, statement this morning, mentioned a number of things, including uh, what he regarded as unnecessary regulation. Uh, who shall determine uh, its necessity? Deputy Fairbrush. Well, ultimately, because we live in a democracy, this assembly, uh, we will have views on it and we will say we think X, Y, or Z. Uh, Insofar as those matters need to come back to this, what will be an open collaborative assembly, it will be this assembly. Deputy Kazan Saver Miller. Thank you, sir. Um, the previous assembly approved the Revive and Thrive uh, plan and the, the, the three pillars of the sustainable economy, community plan, and health plans. Are we building a structure uh, with the new list of uh, priorities that have been identified today, or are we still going to be working to those three key pillars? Thank you. Yes, without necessarily being restricted to that document or doing anything that is in that document, which promises everything. Then. But we need to achieve things. But yes, those are still the key pillars of any basic democratic, decent society such as us. Deputy Trust. So Deputy Fairbrush uh, mentioned in relation to medical tourism uh, changes to the rules uh, uh, regarding bond, which of course require a secure income stream. Can we confirm that any changes that he proposes will uh, ensure that there is a secure income stream in order that the bond uh, remains covered in the manner to which it is today? Deputy Fairbrush. At the moment, yes, and I, I don't mean any equivocation in relation to that because that bond has got to be repaid back in X number of years, uh, and it's over well £300 million. And the interest rate, which was a good one at the time, is not such a good one now. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we will seek to achieve an income because what we need to bring in is income into the bailiwick. And the idea is medical tourism, i.e., an income producing asset. We're not going to go build a sea wall with that money. Deputy Rothman. Would it be a fair brush to confirm that any pursuit of medical tourism is done in such a way as it is not allowed in any way conceivably to further the delays being suffered by local people under the MSG contract? Well, exactly. The MSG contract must be uh, confirmed and it must be met. Uh, I'm happy to give that confirmation. Thank you, sir. Given the pandemic, sir, how uh, does the president intend to strengthen the position of retail and hospitality on the high street and in Guernsey as a whole? 
Deputy Fair So, policy resources is met regularly since uh, our brief tenure in office. We intend to discuss such matters, uh, relief matters, etc. We're going to have further advice in our next meeting, which is due on Tuesday. Uh, um, the Policy Resources Committee had resolved to proceed with the retail bond following uh, Deputy Office uh, Amendment. My understanding is that the present uh, committee are not intending to do so or not intending to do so on the same terms. Could the President advise uh, what the present committee's intention is with regard to the retail bond and whether there is any intention to rescind that previous resolution? Deputy Fairbrush. Uh, we haven't discounted it totally, but we believe that the terms that came forward, which were, I'm not saying they were unreasonable at the time, but things have moved so quickly in relation to world and, uh, and the its finances, that it needs to be revisited. Ordinary Representative Roberts. Thank you, sir. The President of PNR mentioned three monthly meetings with the relevant committees. Will, he, um, will this apply to regular meetings with Alderney? Deputy Fairbrush. Probably not, but I think with Alderney uh, Representative Roberts, as usual, raises a sensible point. And there should be regular meetings with Alderney. As I've said, my able colleague, Deputy Henry, I know, has got a particular interest in Alderney and SAR. He will ensure that, that there are regular contacts with Alderney and Sark at the meetings. I'm not going to tell him because I'd be presumptuous of me how he should do that job, but I'm sure he'll do it well. Deputy Trot. Thank you, sir. Well, Deputy Fairbosch mentioned uh, in Guernsey Finance, as you mentioned, is underfunding. Uh, can you uh, advise the Assembly whether it would be his intention to make specific budget recommendations in a positive way towards that important entity, or, or might we need to wait a little longer uh, to hear what his recommendations will be? Deputy Fairbosch. Well, we'll be beyond the budget because I said it was in January. And what I would like to, well, Deputy Heller in particular, but what the PNR would like to do is sit down with Deputy Trot in his capacity as head of, uh, of Jersey Finance uh, and other people and come up with a discussion as to what funds are needed, how they can be rationalised, how they can be properly spent. Deputy Rothman. Thank you, sir. I realise it's early days in PNR and have decided everything yet, but I wondered if Deputy Fairbosch could give an indication of how you perceives the post-war agreement with Alderney being reviewed, it was in training, is it going to continue, and if so, how? Deputy Fairbush. I'm grateful for Deputy Ruffin, uh, in, uh, as it were, a uh, question, not question his own question, but he's putting that kind of that remark in or influencing it out in certain ways. It certainly needs to be looked at, but what I can say to our friends and colleagues in Alderney, we are in the Bailey Week of Guernsey, which includes Alderney, it's a very important part of it. Uh, there will be discussions, but hopefully there will be, uh, there needs to be variation to it, but I can't stand here and say I know what the variation will be yet. That will be a matter of sensible discussion between good people with good will on both sides. Deputy Gollop. Thank you, sir. Thank you. and looking at the uh, civil service structure and the machine work government potentially, especially not by Deputy Salisbury. Will that imply that maybe the State's Assembly Committee and, 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 and the rest of us can revisit the abortive Deputy Salisbury um, requet, which I signed in the last term, because unfortunately the previous policy resources didn't wish to see that debated at the time. Deputy Fairbush. Again, sir, I have to speak for Deputy Salisbury and I think that may well be in her thought processes at which she reverse back. Deputy Oliver. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I do understand you may not be able, uh, able to answer this question, but um, the last uh, PNR ha was investing in impact investment. Will that be something that this PNR will continue? Deputy Fairbush. Well, it is something that we'll consider. Uh, I'm not going to give an absolute commitment on everything uh, today, but it will be considered. And again, we're not saying, and my remarks are made when I make my speech because you're time limited, uh, so I spoke even more quickly than I normally do to try and get through it. Uh, it's in relation to that, is that there are other issues. Uh, we're open, we're transparent, and we'll discuss anything with anybody. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, this month, the design elections are taking place, and with the island wide voting, the role has obviously slightly, uh, slightly changed. Is it, do you feel there's a, a, this a the to feel there is an opportunity for a vision of of the role of the design and in improving the democratic process and raising the repressions? Thank you. Perhaps if, uh, okay. The design to serve this, this maybe for centuries with good people and they're still serving and they still do very important things for free and they do it very well. The liaison with that would be, as I've already said, Betty Salisbury, we've got ideas and she's got ideas already, I know. The design of ideas, there'll be discussions between the two of them. So the message we'd like to go out beyond the, the, this room to the design is that we really do value your contributions and we, uh, uh, we expect to work well with you in the future. Deputy Charles. Last one from me, sir. Uh, Deputy Fairbrush uh, said um, uh, boldly he wants to get on with things and meet deadlines. So I'd like to ask him in three months' time, uh, at the end of the 100 day period, um, what will success look like? What sort of things will he have done and how can we measure him against that? Deputy Fairbrush. Well, I think it will be measured by the contributions made equally by my colleagues who I've uh, uh, we've divided up, if I can use that phrase in elegantly, uh, various tasks between us. I think the fact is we've made progress. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, but, you know, it was in a long time. Uh, you know, God certainly recorded to some people, a lot of those who might have voted for uh, President Trump last night in certain states, uh, might have thought the world was made in seven days. It actually took a bit longer than that. Uh, but we'll do, I think the success will be that this is certainly and the people of the will, will appreciate that we've got our with what we say we've got on it. Uh, so, would the President please uh, expand a little on the nature of the public meeting before Christmas? Uh, will that be an opportunity for the public to listen in to deliberations by the PNR members, or will it be more of a surgery type arrangement? Thank you. Deputy Furbrush. We haven't actually decided. I think probably because of time, it will be a drop in. The initial meeting will be a drop in. We'll, somewhere in town, for example, well advertised, they can come and see the members of PNR and, and discuss issues with us. But in due course, there will be, whether it's St. James or the Coat Hills or wherever it may be, the five of us will be on a stage, we'll give a presentation, we'll invite people's questions and comments. Deputy Kazan Saver Miller. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I believe, if I believe correctly, we will need to design or define the future for Guernsey plan or whatever name uh, Chief Minister might want to put uh, to it. And uh, with the previous uh, terms, there was, uh, I believe, a wide cons uh, a process in, of consultation and engagement with business bodies and also community. Does it feel we, we have such a long list of priorities that's already designed? Does it, does it mean we don't need that process and we've moved beyond consultation and we'll just get on with doing things? Or will there be an element of consultative process for the future for Guernsey plan in this term? Thank you. Deputy Fairbrush. Well, there has to be consultation because the idea is you want to take people with you. You want people to uh, at least feel they've had a proper listening to, even if you eventually come to a decision, because that's what P&R have got to do. That's what this assembly's got to go, come to a decision. And uh, you can't please everybody all the time. But we must consult. But there comes a time when there's enough consultation and you've got to make a decision. No one else is rising to ask any further questions of the President in the context of the Policy and Resource Committee, Resources Committee's mandate. So we'll move to the next general update statement, the second one, and this is on behalf of the Committee for Economic Development, and I invite the President of the Committee, Deputy Ender, to deliver that. Deputy Ender, please. Uh, thank you, sir. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sir, um, I'm grateful to the State Assembly for putting its confidence in the current members of the Committee for Economic development to play its part in the island's recovery. However, as I said in the Assembly on the 9th of November, this will be the state's wide effort and later in my speech I will come to how we will need to work with all of the new committees. Under Deputies Fairbrush and Parkinson, during the last term, the committee started the process of addressing the challenges for future prosperity, digital connectivity and infrastructure, our competitive offer as a place to do business and how to promote what how to promote that offer. We will be picking up from where they left off, but will act with a greater sense of urgency. The current committee 
brings a diverse set of skills and experience to the table and the committee's responsibilities will be roughly carved up along the following lines. Deputy Faller will be a capable vice president with a remit to ensure that government and business are aligned. Deputy Mokes will provide leadership on the committee's work with the finance sector, ensuring that we understand the opportunities for growth that need government action. Deputy Kazan Savar Miller will lead on digital business, entrepreneurship and skills, working closely with the Digital Greenhouse and other partners to promote entrepreneurship and to transform our skills base on the island. And Deputy Vermeulen will lead on tourism and industry and will work with me on the recovery of our visitor economy. On that challenge, we're about to begin the process of overhauling how we market ourselves as a visitor destination to set out a plan for investment in our tourism product and an accommodation strategy that ensures that we have appropriate bed stock and enable closed hotels to change their use to the benefit of the wider economy. We need to think differently in how we market ourselves as a destination and whether this is the time to transform Visit Guernsey into a public private partnership or form part of some form of LBG. To give an example of how we would need to work with other committees, we would like a closer relationship with both policy and resources, environment and infrastructure, and the Development and Planning Authority. We have some strong ideas on how future tourism offering might better utilise heritage sites, coastal kiosks, and without access to either property services and or the DPA, we can't move forward. In addition, that committee has listened to the visitor economy sector. We will, as part of the recovery strategy, be recommending to the state significant investment in Guernsey's tourism product and enhancing the island's visitor accommodation. We have got to maximise the reasons why people come here. Victor Hugo attractions, our World War II heritage and a wide range of accommodation, including camping and self-catering, excuse me, including camping and self-catering will help to drive that. And of course, in a short term plan to bring back visitors to the island in any new season will mean that Visit Guernsey and Orini could and should work closer together. Our committee will make every effort to build a stronger working relation with STSB under Deputy Roffey's leadership and recent conversations with Deputy Fairbrush and Deputy Roffey will mean the three committees will work closer together. The development of partnerships will be one of the most visible aspects of the new committee's work. There will be no more walls. The committee will work closely with, with environment and infrastructure to develop a plan for the blue economy. In fact, I'm meeting Deputy De Sumray, um informally this week. In fact, I had a coffee with her yesterday and I'm meeting her, I believe, this afternoon. Our two committees having many shared goals in developing a low carbon growth economy. I am aware that Deputy Kazan Miller has a particular interest in sustainable business and Deputy De Sumray has a particular interest in environmental tourism. We will connect. And the committee will work closely with Deputy Prowl, Committee for Home Affairs, to ensure the approach to population management supports the economy. The committee will work closely with the DPA in the short in this term too. I am sure that Deputy Oliver will keep will help to lift the planning regime out of the suffocating red tape mire into which it started to sink towards the end of the last term. And I'm relieved to see that we have an open-minded president, what a change, and a new committee that recognises that they are key to the many aspects of Revive and Thrive. Let's work together to encourage changes of use and exceptions if they drive our economy. And let's use our highly skilled planners to support growth and regeneration. In short, we will make every effort to remove barriers to business and invest in the infrastructure that supports it. This means a new telecom strategy with which offices are now accelerating. The committee will prioritise a reassessment of the island's air connectivity objectives, last agreed by the states in December 2018. The world has changed since then. Reviewing these now will, field into the field, will feed into the air policy framework that is being finalised by PNR and enable the committees to understand its, if policies such as quasi open skies help or hinder the delivery of our objectives. So the engine of our economy is the finance sector and it, and it is world class funds, fiduciary, insurance and banking sectors that have a track work record of quality, stability and innovation.
In the meeting, the representatives of the finance sector during the course of the election, they asked for a number of things. That we stay competitive, we invest in transport and digital connectivity, we reduce red tape and we invest in promotion. We need to support Guernsey Finance and its new leadership in marketing what Guernsey has to offer. And a proposal for increased funding will be with the committee soon. Of course, it is not just Guernsey Finance that needs fresh impetus to aid recovery. The previous committee requested an agency review and officers will now accelerate that work. This will mean a closer working relationship between the Digital Greenhouse and Locate Guernsey. That approach will run through this committee's work. Localisation, assuring that when the taxpayer is funding a project, big or small, as much of that funding goes to local employers and local workers. That is essential for recovery and we must do this. Deputy Sumray asked in the President Q&As what we could do for the creative industry and my response is as it has been for years, there is little or no excuse for any government agency to put creative work outside of this island. Guernsey can perform on any worldwide stage. The aim is to bring back many of the creative contracts that could be undertaken by locally based agencies back to Guernsey where that is possible within the states of Guernsey procurement policy and government money on Ireland benefiting Guernsey business. My first instruction to officers was to seek a review of where we are with all marketing and tourism contracts. We remain positive about Guernsey's tourism future. It is essential to the island and its transport links, but I've had a long held concerns where the government should be providing the marketing services for the industry. And I remind members that the Chief Executive Officer of the States of Guernsey has often repeated, and he has quoted, there are things that government must just shouldn't do. My view is that providing marketing services for tourism is one of them. So we are up and running and trying to move at a pace. Meetings are set up with other committees to ensure partnership. However, we wouldn't mind some input from our largest industry. And with that in mind, we are working with GIBA to invite nominations for experienced non-states members to support this work. We will be looking at the, to do this quickly. So to close, let me reiterate that I promised um, uh, when I took on the presidency, um, four things, focus, collaboration, positivity and decision. And hopefully, sir, that will give you a taste of how the this, this committee will move forward with some grace. Thank you. Thank you very much. So members of the States has now appeared again with up to 20 minutes for questions on any matter within the mandate of the Committee for Economic Development. Deputy Carapel. So my apologies for getting mixed up earlier. I really must learn to curb my enthusiasm. Um, so when I asked the following question of the candidates in the election for president of economic development, did the candidates agree with me that a permanent system for the white van man needed to be introduced here in the island? Deputy Inder said he didn't see it as priority. Therefore, I'd like to ask him, has he discussed the issue with his committee? And if he has, what was the outcome? If he hasn't discussed the issue with his committee, is he able to give me the assurance, please, that he will? So my, my view hasn't changed from um, a couple of weeks ago, and, if I, and I think correctly, um, the other candidate, uh, Deputy Parkinson, agreed. Um, to answer you, his, his uh, question directly, right now there is no intention um, to bring that matter to, to the committee, but if um, Deputy uh, Carapel wants to write to the committee, and, and make that argument, I'm quite sure the committee will reconsider it. But if he's asking me directly as president, I will not be raising it with the committee, but it's absolutely within his right to raise that himself with the committee and write to the committee, and we will give it consideration. Deputy Dudley Owen. Thank you, sir, and I thank the president um, of the Committee for Economic Development for his update, but I am disappointed at a notable omission. Um, what synergies does the president uh, see with the Committee for in uh, education, support and culture, given that the committee, this committee takes care of our future workforce and our heritage assets and culture, vital components of the economy. Deputy Inder. Um, uh, Deputy Dudley Owen, as a previous member, was always keen promoting two areas, it was all three areas in fact, entrepreneurship, skills and digital. And I think she will, will agree with me that there was some resistance in that committee to um, work with education, um, given the makeup of the previous committee. Um, now, the skills development is, is effectively combining a digital skills programme with the Digital Greenhouse, a new offering from Agilis as part of the Smart Guernsey um, and 
Smart Gains Economic Development Programme. But what I will do um, is I will try and find a way, along with our committee, with my committee's agreement, to tie um, education, sport and culture into that in, in, in some way. Deputy Delisle. So the President um, indicated that economic development was to pick up where the former committee left off. As some argue the need to focus, given the pandemic um, and as the world and tourism is at a different place. What areas can, in reality, come under focus given lockdown all around us? Deputy Inder. Um, this will all end one day and we do have to think about a better tomorrow. It's all a fairly miserable place for the whole of Europe to be in at the moment. But if we sit on our shackles, um, sitting on our, our I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know how to express this, but um, we sit back hoping something's going to happen. I can tell you now, hope always will, will get you killed. We need, we need a plan and we need a positive plan. So what we will work on is effectively a, a, a period where the, the pandemic will finish. And so we have to build towards um, the uh, looking at a brighter future for the visitor economy because it's just not about the the hotels, or hostelries, and the events. I will remind members it's actually about transport and air links because without the tourism economy, um, some of the air and sea links will be in a, in a worse place than they, than they than they are now. Deputy Parkinson. So, um, can the President uh, tell us where the committee has got to with the work undertaken by the last committee in respect of an international university presence on Guernsey? I think Augsenture had nearly completed their report. Deputy uh, Inder. I, I can do, sir. Um, we've had uh, three meetings. One of them was procedural. Two of them were um, induction and our next meeting I think is in is in two weeks time I don't believe the Oxensia report is on that um, is, is on uh, that that agenda at the moment but I only saw it la last night um, we've got a number of op options and I know um, uh, Deputy Parkinson has worked on it for years. We've got a number of options. When it comes to us, we will give it great consideration. If it looks like it's um, it's something that we that, that's good to go, obviously the committee will bring a policy letter to the states. Another option is just to stop the project if we're not happy with it. Actually, one of the other options is to bring a green paper to the states and get some direction um, from. Uh, the states where they want to go go with it, but but part of me um, would like to include education, sport, and culture in some of those uh, considerations later on and see, see what their what their view in it. So we have a number of options. So to answer his um, uh, question directly right now, having only had uh, uh, three three meetings, the Excelsior report has not been on the table or on the agenda. Deputy Gollop. Yeah. Yesterday we heard the disappointing news, linked to STSB actually, uh, that, the, that the post office in Smith Street will close next year. But that is part of maybe a trend of declining retail and customer service in St Peterport. What retail strategy are economic development working on to reignite town centres? I think in my um, pitch for the presidency. I, I did talk about having some kind of residence strategy. Um, Deputy Fairbrush has, has touched on um, getting more people living in town. The idea by the private sector. I think you mentioned the uh, Guernsey Housing Association. It is absolutely key, and I think that's the big thing that has been missed in all the conversations about retail strategy is the residence strategy. The more people living in town, as touched on by Deputy Latoka, I remember a couple of states meetings. Uh, uh, ago is the more people you get into town the more vibrant you will have in, um, have in the town centre and I think that's where everything starts get people living in town first. Deputy Sam Pierre. So um, given uh, Deputy Fairbrush's previous comments and his statement around the need for fiscal restraint in order to find the additional funds for Guernsey Finance and given Deputy Inder's views in relation to visit Guernsey does uh, Deputy Inder see it as being uh, a substantial um, uh, issue of reprioritising the existing budget of the Committee for Economic Development from uh, the visit, visit Guernsey to, um, to Guernsey Finance. Is that, in essence, how additional funds are going to be found? Uh, well, we, 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 as uh, Deputy St. Pierre um, pointed out, we've only got a £6 million budget of 2.6 of it is the Visit Guernsey um, accounts. Um, 
In short, um, we, we, I've spoken to Mr. Uh, Pleasant recently. Um, um, he is writing to us. I'm, we are expecting uh, a report to him, at least a draft report by the middle of November. I'm expecting a sort of fatted out report by the end of November. And to answer his question directly, we don't have the budget because we, we just have a very small budget. So it will be a pitch for extra money from policy resources and hopefully we'll get some support from that. Deputy Trot. So, uh, additional funding for the promotion and marketing of our major industry through Guernsey Finance is most welcome, uh, and I continue uh, to give such initiative my full support. However, it appears from answers given earlier from the President of Policy and Resources that uh, the funding will fall outside of the normal budget debate later this month. That was a, an answer given to a, an explicit question. How then will such additional funding be resourced? How will such additional resources be funded if they're outside of the budget debate, if it doesn't come from uh, the, uh, the the President's uh, uh, existing committee funds? Deputy Ender, um, we've had a number of pots uh, rattling around. Hopefully some of them will actually be reduced, but I think we've got a future Guernsey fund. Um, and ultimately, I, I, th I think there are exceptions, um, and I, I honestly think um, the, the lack of uh, lack of um, investment we put into Guernsey Finance is one of them, is that when we recognise it, um, I, I, I don't think there's a, there's, a, there's a reason that I shouldn't make the, um, uh, make the argument to pass in resources with their help, and if not, we'll make it through, the, um, uh, make it through this House. Deputy Oliver. Thank you, sir. Um, both the President of PPNR and now Economic Development have said they need a change in the visitor accommodation. Um, DPA has been waiting for a visitor accommodation report. Will that actually materialise? Yes, it will do. Oh, oh sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, yes, it will do. Um, one of the things that we have done in between our three meetings of uh, procedural and two induction is uh, give instruction to officers to start looking at an, an accommodation strategy and I think we said, and, and, and it, I won't mislead, but I think we said we wanted it um, within, within six months. Deputy Saint-Pierre. Sir, so is the um, redevelopment of Neil's Yard a priority for the Committee for Economic Development? Uh, and if so, what role will the Committee play in achieving that? Deputy Inder. Um, I, t I understood it. it came via Riquet, um, an amended Riquet th through policy and resources. Whether it's actually our priority as economic development, um, we haven't given it sort of much thought. I've, I've heard through the election, I think it came from uh, Deputy um, Parkinson, and I think he used the word, there's an oven baked um, policy letter hanging around somewhere. Well, it is. It doesn't come from our committee. Um, so I believe if there is one, then it must. Um, it, it, this all seems to be property management, large bits of uh, funding all comes from policy and resources rather than economic development. Deputy Delisle. So this is a time for focus and change. I don't hear that coming through. What change and what focus is to be made in the new economic uh, development committee? We changed the committee. Uh, well, that, that's something that we did do. And, I, and, I, and I'll reiterate what I said to this committee when I pitched for this. Um, uh, I, told, I told them uh, a number of things. Within six months, within six months, Deputy Delal, um, we will have the final mile policy letter. Within six months, we will recognise that the £2.4 million pounds that we, had, with, that we spend supporting t tourism is disproportionate to the amount that we spend on Guernsey fi finance. Um, and so within six months, we will appoint an, uh, a non-states member. Within two weeks, I gave instructions to our uh, Visit Guernsey team to start looking at the contracts. Um, within two days, I gave we, our committee of um, uh, our committee have instructed our officers to look at accommodation strategy. Now, I, I don't know what um, Deputy Delar thinks movement looks like, but that looks like movement and action to me. Deputy Carapel. 
So in response to my earlier question, Deputy Inder said, I should make an official request in writing to the committee to discuss the issue of introducing the permit system for the white right man here in the island. In relation to that, why can't the committee look into the matter of their own accord? Seeing as Deputy Inder said on several occasions in his speech, we must keep as much money on our island as possible, and they are mandated to support local businesses. Why do they need a kiss of life to kickstart them from a colleague? Are they not reneging on their own mandate? Deputy Ender, I know I'm not reneging on my own mandates. Um, now, if, if de sometimes, sir, through you, sir, um, if deputies don't like what they hear, it must mean that the answer is wrong. Um, but the answer has been, it been absolutely clear. I did say that if I was doing anything today, I, I would, I would um, be looking at the nine month, three month short term uh, licenses and ensuring that they don't leave before Easter of next year. If I was doing anything today, I'd be looking at the five-year lic licences and, and giving those people um, some latitude to allow businesses which are already in the island, they are losing staff because, um, in, in part due to um, coming to the end of their licence. That's the problem in Guernsey. The problem at the moment is not a white, white man coming to Guernsey, it's the fact that we're losing, we're, we are currently losing our, um, uh, our, I'm going to use the word foreign um, workforce because they are coming to the ends of their licences. So the short answer is I will not be raising it with the committee. If one other member of the committee wants to raise that's entirely up to them. I cannot be clearer than that. Deputy Gollop. Whilst agreeing with the President's vision and committee's position that a review is needed of, of the of the structure of Visit Guernsey and it, 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 its management policy, etc. Um, is the committee planning at this stage to reduce the budget that the states gives to support the visitor economy and tourism generally, rather than just enhance what's given to Guernsey Finance? Deputy and, uh, and what we need to do is to start from scratch. I had a meeting with the officers uh, a week ago and asked them one thing. I said, if we had a blank piece of paper, would we be doing what we're doing now? And the answer was clearly no. Um, right now, the majority of our offers, if not all of them, that are employed by Visit Guernsey have been redeployed elsewhere. Effectively, tourism at the moment um, has got some prepared set of creative work, as I understand. They've booked no um, media forward because unless they know when the pandemic's going to you know, going to end, and I, I can't see that happening. So right now, if there was ever an opportunity to reimagine the Guernsey brand, what it's been delivering, what it's doing, the media it's using, its processes, everything, now is the time. So to answer your question, we haven't got that far, but there is a clear message, the time to change is now. Deputy Blinn. Um, Thank you, sir. Um, can the President explain what sort of planning or consideration is being made um, in view of any negative knock-on effects of, of Brexit? Deputy Inder. Um, I'm dead. The question is a bit generic and, I, and I, I'm, 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 I'm going to sit down again and invite um, De Deputy Blim because I just can't answer that question. I'll ask him if he could be a little bit more specific. Perhaps you can take it up in writing between the two of you. Right. Deputy Sampia. Sir, um, following up on the previous question, Neil's Yard is not um, in state's ownership, so it isn't a matter for Deputy Mahoney and state's property <coughs> services, um, and it's not really a matter for PR per se. Uh, my question really is whether the Committee for Economic Development see it as an economic opportunity for the island, and if so, uh, will they be uh, bringing their uh, voice to um, support all those that want to enable that regeneration opportunity to happen. Deputy and uh, I don't think I can answer that with a, with a, with a, with a straight yes. Deputy Gollop. So I, I've been given to understand that um, uh, work was done some time ago to uh, consider uh, further legislation in relation to our ferry railway ramps. Uh, and therefore my question is, uh, given the promotion of connectivity and tourism and inter-Ireland, UK and French travel when circumstances permit, um, what, what, how, are economic development planning to develop the work Deputy Trot and others were doing in relation to encouraging um, sea passenger transport? 
Yeah, there's two parts of it. Um, the, the significant piece of work or two, I suppose, it's the um, operating agreement, actually the ramp licences. And uh, so the ramp licence is important. I believe that's going to come shortly. I won't give a date on it because almost inevitably I will mislead, but we are working on it in the very short term. I just can't remember the dates. Um, there was some talk in the media. I don't know if this helped at all. Um, and there was a question by one member of the assembly whether this was the time to um, negotiate the operating agreement. One, we're under direction. And two, um, given that we've got new owners, um, quite clearly a changed transport, a regional transport industry, um, I generally think now is the time um, to, to, to effectively ensure we get the best possible service and, and in, an investment to protect the protect those services. I, don't, I generally don't think there's any time for dilly, dilly dallying around. We have to work with Jersey, we have to be sensible, we have to work with Guernsey, we have to work, uh, work with the uh, new reality and once though we've got a direction we'll be reporting to Polish Resources and eventually I believe there'll be a policy letter that we'll submit to the states. Deputy Trot. Thank you, sir. So in three months time uh, what will success look like uh, at the end of the first 100 days for the new Economic Development Committee? Uh, and how will we measure such success? Uh, and I'm hopeful, sir, that it will be a slightly better question than the one that my friend, the President of the Policy and Resources Committee, gave earlier. I, I think it's the same question. It may be the answer that you're thinking about, yeah. Deputy Schrock. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Inder. Uh, it's actually exactly the Let's same. See. It's actually the same question as um, Deputy Delal. Um, uh, maybe, maybe Deputy Trot was out of the room at the moment, but I, I, I did say that Within six months, we will have a final mild policy letter. I've spoken about the investment in Guernsey Finance. Um, we will have appointed non-states members. We've always set an accommodation uh, strategy in place, and I've just spent uh, probably too long talking about tourism. So that looks like action to me. Deputy Mirveld. Would the President agree with me that a good way to measure the success of your committee and other committees will be to compare uh, the first 100 days of this state with the first 100 days of the previous assembly. Thank you, sir. And, uh, yes, I do agree with that, um, but that won't take long, will it? Deputy Blinn. Um, can the President um, outline if in their plans for um, um, for this term, they would consider the development of the Victor Hugo Centre, which has been talked about over many terms, if that's in their list. Yes, um, the end, uh, oh, sorry, the, I'm, I'm, I'm too fast on my feet, so I apologise. Um, I think the tourism strategy was written in 2017, um, and it wasn't really dusted off when I was there for the final 18 months of the committee, and I'm never entirely sure why, but um, we, are, we are going to commit to that. We need to have a look at that quite seriously, and if there are investment opportunities, we will make, we will make recommendations. Deputy Trott. So following that rather odd question from Deputy Mierveld, who was the President of the Economic Development Committee for the first 100 days of the last term? Deputy Trott, I mean, it's a matter of public record as to who was the President of that committee. And, it, uh, and, and it's not really a question in the context of the mandate of this current committee, so it's not about the work that it's going to do. So I think, I think we'll take that as read, shall we? The, the 20 minutes are now up. Uh, but if there are members <laughs> who are keen to ask Deputy Inder further questions uh, in the context of its mandate, please, uh, please do rise because we've got all day. God, <laughs> I, I'll take Deputy Berry first, I think, on that basis. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, there's been much talk of the finance um, industry and investment in obviously our largest industry. Um, could the president tell us and expand a bit further on your vision for a strategy for supporting smaller businesses and startups? Deputy Inder. A couple of things that have um, turned up over the last six months, things like access to banking accounts. I think that that's important. I mean, just being able to start a bank account would, would, would be would be a, a start. Um, we've spoken about deregulation and you and uh, Deputy Barry is absolutely right um, that the big ticket um, names that always come out of economic development are either finance or tourism and something gets le left in between us. I think certainly what we've recognised as a committee and it's very embryonic, manufacturing 
is important and what we would call the real economy. We've already spoken about a retail and a residence strategy, but nothing's been basically that we can, I could put in six or seven points, but what I can assure Deputy Perry is that there will be real consideration to what are the working families, those in Guernsey that start up their businesses and, and take some of the greatest risks and they're the ones that are visible that when they fail. So in, in short, Mayor, I, 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 so through you, I, I come from uh, that neck of the woods and I, I don't forget where I'm from. Deputy Salisbury. Thank you, sir. Um, the uh, President of the um, God, Economic Development Committee uh, has referenced both the tourism strategy and retail strategy. Of course, neither of those ever came to the States. Will he commit to bringing those strategies for the States to approve? Deputy Inder. I, I actually mentioned a resident strategy and there was and a retail strategy. Um, can I, if I can get the tourism strategy out of the way, there was some push by the, by the last house to, br to bring a tourism strategy and if they meant the promotional activity on top of that how we're going to deliver the idea of um 38 people picking through um a tourism strategy thinking something should be blue or something should be green or that field should be i i just i would not bring that to to, to the states but um the actual tourism strategy itself which i believe was delivered to our committee and i don't think it was debated by the previous states i can't remember it was um i i'm not call to the idea but again until i've spoken to um, get a view of my committee i cannot commit to that at, at the moment is there any member who hasn't asked a question yet who wishes to ask a question in this session uh, so i'll take deputy dyke before deputy carapel thank you sir could i ask the president a question regarding the extension of the runway um I'm sure he either has or will be reading the Frontier report on, on the costings and, and economics of the, of the project. Um, what I thought was lacking from that report, and I would ask if he would address it, is, is the question of using the EMAS artificial uh, safety zone, which was not part of the Frontier report, and which I understand would, would halve the cost of the 1700 metre extension. Is that something he can uh, push to address and investigate? Deputy Inder, are you able to answer that question? Deputy Dyke, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your question. Um, I'm in danger of um, responding um, in, incorrectly. I think what I'll do in, in, at this point is, if you don't mind, um, I, I will um, take your question and we will write back to you and all, and all states members to give that consideration because right now in my head I can't remember picking through every single final de detail of the Frontier Economics um, report but if I, if I do remember correctly Correctly, we were supposed to be looking at um, a. Or I do remember correctly, a runway up to 1,700 metres. It's the bits. It's the bits in between. I'm right now just a little bit flaky on. So if if, if that's all right with you, I'd I'd rather uh, write back to you and respond. That is very fine with me. Yes, very happy. It's, it's the answer to the question, Deputy, and uh, you you volunteered to to respond in writing in due course, uh, Deputy Latoc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Um, I'm heartened by much of what I've heard from the President of Economic Development. Would he and his committee, however, um, be willing to and to see more done uh, with regards to the brands that Guernsey has? We live, we live in an age particularly of branding. I'm not just talking about Victor Hugo, which is mentioned. I'd like to see more done there, but Guernsey, the Guernsey breed, for example, and indeed the safe and secure place that Guernsey is known increasingly as uh, throughout the world. Deputy Ender. Yes, I, I think that the short answer to that is personally, again, not from the committee view, is, is certainly yes. We've. Um, I remember there was uh, an idea of the manufacturing output coming under a golden Guernsey brand. Um, there's no two ways about it. The, the, the Guernsey cow has, has a place, not just in our society in the world, but what I notice, we've got digi digital Guernsey one way, we've got locate the other way, we've got visit Guernsey down in that corner, brands all over the place. Well, I say brands, I, I, I actually, it, nine times out of 10, just logos. I'm not sure Guernsey has a brand itself. So to answer your question, that, that that's something we have to give some consideration. I suspect part of the answer will come up in the agency review if indeed we combine some of those agencies. 
Deputy Burford. Thank you, sir. Given that this assembly has been commissioning very costly reports on the possibility of a runway extension for a decade or more, and has never resolved to progress the project, is it time to conclude that the idea is dead and that £100 million could be spent much more effectively, particularly on revitalising sea links? Deputy Yinder. Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's not um, to conclude that at all. That, that, that is quite clearly um, uh, Deputy Burford's personal view on it. That is not what the Frontier Economics Report said. So, um, what, what I can say, and though it's not a direct answer to her question, is that the previous committee, because we were in the middle of a pandemic, didn't want to really um, look at spending and re reviewing, reviewing something. The advice to the current committee is effectively, well, in short, Frontier Economics are quite happy to take our money for another short review, but they know what the answer is. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So, as, we, as and if we ever, when we peter out, out of this, we will be will be having a refresh of, of that, um, hopefully in the in the first quarter of um, first quarter of next year. Again, but by by, by the grace or otherwise of this of this COVID nineteen, we, we we tend to go. But to answer your question, I think that's very much her personal opinion, and not necessarily the evidence that came out of the wrong one one my extension report. Deputy Oliver. Thank you, sir. In um, most people's manifestos, they put that they would attract entrepreneurs to the island. How is the economic development going to succeed in doing that? Deputy Ender. We had a um, short presentation with Locate Guernsey yesterday. Um, so, it, it, uh, and things seem to be heading in, the, in, in, in certainly the right direction, and there's clear evidence um, that they have been benefiting the island to the tune of, I think, over the last four years. Their figure is was around 4.8 million. I can't remember the amount of people they brought to the island. The pinch points are, oddly enough, um, uh, the lack or two uh, two areas of the open market is some of the lower end quality, and uh, some of the high, higher end costs. But it looks like Locate Guernsey has filled up the gaps that it can at the at, at the moment. Um, but any more detail than that, I can't, I can't really give you. But thank you for the question, Deputy Carapel. So as we all know, part of the mandate of the committee is to promote all sectors of business, including construction, creative industry, financial services, horticulture, intellectual property, uh, and several other areas. So can the president tell me what the committee will be doing to promote horticulture in the future, please? Deputy Inder. That's a good question. And the reason I say it's a good question because I've got a straight answer to that at the moment. I haven't really thought that through more than that. Um, again, with that one, uh, you've got me there, Deputy Carapal. It hasn't come up um, recently, and I can't remember it coming up in the last six months of the previous uh, committee. But I will certainly give that some consideration and write to you directly and all other members. Deputy Garlock, we might make this the last question for repeat questioners. Yes. I note later on in the agenda, Deputy Lester Kerbel has questions pertaining to art strategy to ESC. But my question is, uh, has economic development considered the impact the creative sector makes in Guernsey and therefore the amount of support, funding, encouragement and facilitation they can give to art, sports and the creative sector uh, both economically and socially. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a bit repetitive here. Um, I, I was born of the creative um, industry, and I know how important and, and how under, underrated is, uh, it has been over the years. I did talk about procurement policy. I think that has to change. I mentioned it in the previous speech. I mentioned it in this speech as well. Um, I'm a great supporter of the arts personally. I may not, I may look more like one of them. Um, uh, I may look more like one of Caravaggio's uh, horror paintings, but uh, the reality is it's, it's, it's something I'm extremely fond of. Um, the Victor Hugo Centre kind of plays in that into a way. I think guernsey has got a very good story to tell in modern digital, um, how, it, how, it, um, how it performs on, on the world stage and also its history. So in short, um, there are certainly uh, warm ears and a, and a warm heart for me in, in, in that regard, Deputy Gollipo. Deputy Hellier. Sir, thank you. Um, during the last term of the States, 
many decisions were taken in silos which were apparent to the public as being strategically difficult when you look at the mandates of other committees. Um, a number of the issues you've been talking about and which fall within the committee's mandate uh, involve decisions strategically which need to be made across a whole group of different committees. Can I ask, is the President committed to working in a collegiate way to uh, achieve results in that way? Deputy and uh, Absolutely, as, as I referred to in my, um, uh, in my, in, in my, my first speech, uh, as I've said to anyone who listen, actually we, we, as we are called economic and we are called development. Actually the levers are often elsewhere. We mentioned, I, I mentioned about the heritage sites, the tourism we could use. We need to work with policy and resources. Um, I mentioned, um, what else to talk about? I talk, spoke about some of the um, uh, issues we may have with population management law. I had a meeting with uh, Deputy Prowl um, only yesterday. Um, yesterday I had a coffee with him, uh, environmental, environment infrastructure, uh, the Deputy Lindsay de, de Summary, and we're having another meeting today. So, so in short, short so those, those walls that did did exist, and I think it was down to the personalities more than the actual processes. They, they have been. So I, I don't. I don't see them as I saw in the and the previous committee. We've got different people uh, working very differently, and my, my my feeling is what I'm seeing is that I think this whole um, uh, political body is going to work together much more than it has done in the last four years, if not eight years. Well, members of the states, you have more than 10 minutes extra of questioning Deputy Ender, so uh, we'll draw a line in the sand on that one, shall we now? Uh, and we'll move into question time proper, which starts with questions being posed by Deputy Gollop. First of all, to the President of the Committee for Education, Sport and Culture. So, Deputy Gollop, your first question to Deputy Dudley Owen. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bailiff, sir. Uh, can the new president at Education, Sport and Culture assure the new assembly that given normal circumstances and constraints, her committee and department will work to deliver a workable and acceptable solution to the secondary school campus development programme and model for secondary education within the next 12 months? Well, the president of the committee, Deputy Dudley Owen, to reply. Sir, the short and emphatic answer is yes. The resolutions of the previous assembly currently oblige the committee to carry out a review of the structure of secondary education to be debated no later than the 28th of April 2021. The committee believes that timeline is achievable. We owe it to the students who attend our secondary schools both now and in the future and all of the professionals and support staff who have had to put up with uncertainty for far too long to bring clear and workable proposals back to this assembly so that we can put an end to that uncertainty. My colleagues here today will shortly receive a placeholder invitation to a session early next month when the committee will share with them the work brought about by the pause and review process. That session will be this assembly's first step on the journey towards agreeing and then delivering the right secondary education model for Guernsey. So looking around me today, I'm reminded of how influential previous debates on this subject have been in shaping the makeup of this current assembly. So through you, I urge colleagues to roll their sleeves up and get involved with this vital work at every opportunity so that when the time comes for debate, we are all thoroughly informed to make the right choices for the community that has entrusted us to see this work through. There's a supplementary question, Deputy Gollop. My supplementary would be, given the enthusiasm of the committee uh, for getting on with the job, um, would they welcome the input and maybe even participation of other members of this House Assembly and the other states members who don't have the privilege of sitting on education, sport and culture? Deputy Dudley Owen. Absolutely. Uh, that's something that I um, put in my presidential speech about uh, looking at working parties. It's something that's briefly been mentioned in the, the just one uh, committee uh, meeting that we've had to date. But it's definitely something that I will be uh, seeking to, um, to promote to all members of the Assembly to try and get involved wherever the opportunities arise. And certainly in terms of working party, parties and members have already expressed an interest in joining those, which I'd, I'd welcome any other um, approaches as well from any other members. Thank you. Deputy Delau, supplementary question. So the uncertainty uh, in secondary education has been extended by the pause and review. Why have we not been given details of the results of the four options review? Deputy Dudley Owen. 
Thanks, Deputy Dla, for his question. Um, well, the review hasn't actually concluded as yet, and therefore it would be inappropriate to bring a review back to this assembly, informally or otherwise, that hasn't actually been concluded with the engagement of the relevant stakeholders, which is exactly why the requette was bought in the first place. As no one else is rising, I'll turn to Deputy Gollop to pose his second question to the President. Deputy Gollop. Will, will the committee be considering as part of that pause and review process of evaluating the best way forward for secondary education, educational outcomes of excellence and the different financial budgetary inputs each model may require to give the best opportunity for all pupils and educators. Deputy Dudley Owen to reply, please. So again, the short answer is yes. I am sincerely grateful to Deputy Gollop for his questions. He has presented me with an opportunity to explain the evaluation work as approved by a majority of the previous states subsequent to the pause and review requette, and which has been carried out under the direction of the outgoing committee. That work considers a range of factors which include the quality of education, which also looks at the impact on educational outcomes, value for money, which encompasses capital, revenue and transition costs, and the impact on the infrastructure within the surrounding schools. The current engagement with teachers about this evaluation process will conclude over the next couple of weeks. After that, this new committee will review the findings of all the stakeholder consultation that has taken place over the last few months, as well as the technical work carried out by officers, all of which will help to identify the model for the structure of secondary education that is the best fit for Guernsey. Our findings will be shared and form the basis of the state's member sessions and wider engagement. Deputy Gollop, supplementary question. Thank you very much, sir. Members could argue this would be more appropriately directed to Deputy Furbrush, but here goes. My question is, uh, given uh, the, the ESC commitment to maximising the best possible uh, solution, if that requires increased funds for either capital or revenue expenditure, will cooperation be sought immediately from policy and resources before returning to the Assembly? Deputy Dudley, I to reply. I'll be seeking cooperation from the Policy and Resources Committee immediately, no matter what the outcome of the review is, because I think closer working together on a constructive and positive footing is inevitable. Um, it will inevitably lead to, to the best outcome for Guernsey in the same way that collaboration across the states with, with other members will also lead to the same. Deputy De Laos. So my understanding is that the um, the numbers and the um, options uh, that were considered by the last uh, committee uh, have already been delivered to the department and should be available for uh, release immediately because I just feel that um, this uncertainty is dragging on and certainly has an effect on um, economic development and um, uh, uh, um, future um, investors' uh, options in choosing this island for their uh, new programmes. What's the question, Deputy Delar? <laughs> the question is, can we have the results of that study uh, quickly because it's, 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 it's um, causing uh, uh, a delay and uh, continued uncertainty in education. Deputy Dudley Owen to reply. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, David, uh, Deputy Delar's um, question has given me an opportunity to reiterate that states members will shortly be receiving a placeholder and subsequent invitation to a session which will be uh, used to inform and share the results of the review. Thank you. As no one else is rising, we'll turn next, Deputy Gollop, to the questions that you wish to pose to the President of the Committee for Home Affairs. So your first question to Deputy Prow, please. Thank you very much, sir. Will the new Home Affairs Committee Board be committing itself to bringing a report regarding options for looking at modernising the law of the island's law enforcement towards illegal and prescribed drugs, especially with a cannabis or hemp basis, within the next nine months of this assembly term. 
I invite the President of the Committee, Deputy Proud, to reply. Thank you, sir. I, I thank Deputy uh, Gollop for his, uh, his questions. Uh, sir, the Committee is under a resolution uh, to work with colleagues at Health and Social Care and report back to the Assembly with options for alternative and non-punitive approaches to the possession and use of small quantities of illegal drugs, including, but not limited to cannabis. These options will be informed by work being led by HSC to develop a combined substance use strategy. The resolution is clear that this should be considered by the Assembly within six months of the states considering the combined substance use strategy. Consider considering this strategy will therefore impact on the committee's timetable for presenting options to the states. Thank you, sir. No one wishes to ask any supplementary questions, so I invite Deputy Gold to put his second question to the President. Thank you, sir. It's been partly answered already. But will the new Home Affairs Committee be actively working and jointly collaborating with other states' departments in terms of holistic drug use and justice review and outcomes policy with other states' departments, especially health and social care? The President, Deputy Proud, to reply, please. Thanks, sir. Yes. The committee will endorse uh, the Minister's predecessor that it will be essential for the success of the future justice policy that, that is sustainable and meets the needs of the community for it to be progressed as a cross committee priority. In addition, there will be a need for the Assembly to collectively commit to the sourcing of this review to ensure that work can progress at a meaningful pace. Supplementary is it, Deputy Gollop? Supplementary is, um, is the President able at this stage, therefore, to indicate that approximately in six months' time, uh, the, uh, the report will at least be open for public consultation, if not debate in the Assembly? Deputy Proud to reply. Thank, thank you, sir. I think it's important to, to stress at, at, at this, this stage that a, a lot of work has already been done. Uh, the green paper that uh, was actually de debated and, and the, the resolutions has put in place a, a framework for the new committee um, to work with. I, I've already outlined as best I possibly can what the timetables will be, but what I can tell uh, Deputy Gollop is I am sure from the first meeting that we've had that the committee is absolutely commi committed both to consultate consultation with this House and with the wider stakeholders and to get the whole justice review piece back before the states as soon as it practically can. Thank you, sir. And I now invite Deputy Gollop to place his third and final question to the President. Deputy Gollop, please. Thank you very much, sir. How far will the uh, President of Home Affairs, Deputy Plow, and, and new members be able to share and facilitate for other members and the wider community and professional rehabilitation sectors the work and conclusions of respected Liverpool John Moores University Professor Harry Sumnall in identifying a helpful path forward in looking at both legislation and the wider context of substance use and abuse? Deputy Plow to reply, please. I again thank uh, De Deputy Gollop for this uh, for this question because it gives me the opportunity to stress that the independent report by Professor Sumner was commissioned by HSC and was published in July 2020 and I was part of that committee at that time. The report which explores the interaction between the health and justice systems with respect to drug use and how this can best promote the health, well-being and safety of people who use drugs and the wider community is just one element that will help us to inform the committee's proposals in relation to the future justice policy. Thank you, sir. Supplementary question, Deputy Gollop. Uh, thanking, thanking Deputy Prower and Home Affairs for their answers. Uh, but subsequent to the publication of that report, uh, election issues were raised 
about the therapeutic use for people with relaxation or other or health concerns. How far will the report address that question as well as the interaction between the law enforcement and, and, and illegal drug use? Deputy Proud to reply, please. Th thank you, sir. Um, I think this, the question in part um, would be better, better addressed to uh, the, the Committee of Health and so Social Care in so far as the uh, therapeutic use of, of substances such as cannabis or the medic medicinal use, because um, much work uh, has already happened in, in last term to, to progress the, these elements. What I can say is that uh, there is a commitment uh, both at, uh, from both presidents, home affairs and health and social care to work very closely together. And also uh, there is a commitment uh, for much cross committee working as possible because as the question uh, suggests, the two elements are connected and, and therefore the solutions that are best for the community are best arrived at by cross-committee working. Thank you, sir. Second supplementary, Deputy Gold. Yes. It, 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 it has the President, in interacting with the new board so far, the new board membership, been able to identify what, what diverse members view are on this uh, and the related issues relating to uh, cannabis uh, decriminalisation, use and, and so on. Deputy Proud to reply. Thanks, sir. What, what I can tell Deputy Gollop is that the committee is absolutely committed to uh, looking at this subject, subject in the round together with a, a substance misuse strategy um, which is in the ownership of health and social care around tobacco, alcohol and sub substance use. And the, the role of the Home Affairs Committee is that interaction uh, with, with the criminal justice system. And again, as I've uh, outlined, this is in a piece of structured work uh, <clears throat> in the, the form of the justice review. And that is a process where consultation with all the stakeholders, with, with this assembly and the public will need, need, to, need to take place. So I, I hope that gives um, Deputy Gollop some assurance of, of how we intend to proceed with this. Thank you, sir. Deputy Oliver. Thank you, sir. Um, it's quite well known that Deputy Prout was a member of Drug Concern and also um, his views on cannabis were made quite um, clear during the election. Will you be able to, will Deputy Proud be able to put those views aside and produce a non-biased report? Deputy Proud, do you wish to answer that question? Abs abs absolutely. Um, the, 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 as I've ex explained, there, there, there is a structure in place which, which will be f followed. It will be open and transparent. It will listen to all the stakeholders, all the representations. Um, that, that is actually a commitment that I did personally give during the ele uh, election. Um, the, the deputy has also made a reference to uh, uh, a, a charity of which I was a director called, called Drug Concern. Um, I, I, I resigned when I, uh, from that organisation when I became a, uh, a de deputy in 2016. But um, one of the major philosophies of that ch charity was to be non-judgmental. And um, I have, during the election campaign, if I was asked a straight question, I gave a straight uh, answer. Cannabis is a class B, B drug. Uh, it has been a class B drug for, for, for a long time. Uh, I didn't put it on the, on, 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 the, on the register. That is a fact. Thank you, sir. Very much. We now move on to the next set of questions, which have been trailed by Deputy Gollop already, uh, but these are to be posed by Deputy Carapel 
to the President of the Committee for Education, Sport and Culture. So Deputy Carapaz, first question, please. Thank you, sir. So we were told in the previous assembly by the Committee for Education, Sport and Culture that an art strategy was being worked on by the department, but the assembly never received the update it was promised. Can the president tell me, please, if the strategy has come to a standstill or not? If it has, what measures will the committee be introducing in an attempt to accelerate it being laid in front of the states? If it hasn't, and everything is going to plan, can the president tell me when it will be laid in front of the states, please? Deputy Dudley, I to reply, please. Sir, I'm grateful to Deputy Carapal for his question. As I made clear in my speech when seeking election as the committee's president, I recognise the importance of the arts in the broadest sense, both to our community and to those visiting our beautiful islands. The arts strategy has not come to a standstill, but it would be fair to say that those that progressed during the last political term were slower than had been hoped by all those involved. It would be premature of me at this very early stage of the committee's tenure, and given that it has only met once since its members were elected, to commit to a specific timeline for bringing an art strategy forward for debate. But I will commit to progressing this work stream alongside, and not after, work streams connected to the Transforming Education Programme. And of course, in doing so, we will be mindful of the need to align our work with the broader state's objectives that will emerge through the detailed policy plans that will support the COVID-19 recovery strategy. So there are no supplementary questions. I'll invite Deputy Carol to, Carapel to post his second question, please. So thank you. So what does the President and her committee hope the art strategy is going to actually achieve and what assurance can she give me that it won't be just a list of well-intended but unattainable aspirations? Deputy Dudley, I to reply. Sir, I said a moment ago that this work is not at a standstill. I'll flesh that comment out a little. There's already a work plan in place which has six strategic aims sitting alongside five key objectives that the Guernsey Arts Commission is now working towards. I'd like to reassure Deputy Carapal that these are more than well-intended but unattainable aspirations. For example, the first of these objectives, which was to refocus the Guernsey Arts Commission, has seen the introduction of a new set of commissioners, a full review of their governance arrangements, which were signed off last month, and the start of a new business plan for the Commission. A new chair has been elected to the Commission and is ready to take the helm at the end of the year. The reinvigorated Arts Commission, operating with a renewed sense of purpose, will use art as an enabler to achieve specific measurable goals that have been that are de, sorry that have a demonstrably demonstrably positive impact on the island and islanders. And of course, this aligns with the committee's core purpose, which is to encourage human development by maximizing opportunities for participation and excellence through education, learning, sport, and culture at every stage of life. Supplementary question, Deputy Carapel. Please. Um, so in a response, the President said a new chair has been elected to the Commission. She didn't actually say who that was, so can she tell me please who the new chair is? And what will they be doing that the current chair isn't actually doing? And I ask that because the Commission was already using art as an enabler to achieve specific measurable goals. So for the President to say the reinvigorated Arts Commission will use art as an enabler, may sound impressive, but it's nothing new, hence my question. We'll take that as your two supplementary questions, which is the identity of the person and the second question. Deputy Dudley Owen to reply to both, please. I'm disappointed to let uh, Deputy Carapal know that I don't have those details to hand. It's far too early in the term, um, and I hope he will forgive me, but I will circulate those details later um, because uh, previous to these questions, I, I thought it was uh, the previous uh, Mr. Trevor Wakefield who'd done an excellent job as the chair, um, still in situ, which I understand he is, but I'm afraid I haven't got the details that he's asked for, but I, I will commit to uh, circulating those. Thank you. Deputy Gollop, supplementary question. Um, Given um, uh, the commitment of education, sport and culture to the arts and related activities, uh, will the President and her board be actively working with other committees, policy and resources, environment and infrastructure, and especially economic development to ensure that we have holistic cooperation, identifying arts as part of our economy too? And Deputy Dudley, I'm 
Indeed, and thank you, Deputy Gollop, for giving me yet another opportunity to uh, reiterate what I have said just in my presidential speech and, and previously, I think, outlined from uh, my uh, question, which may have had a slight tone to, uh, to it to uh, Deputy Inder earlier about collaborative working across committee. I think it's um, incumbent on all of us to hold each other to account, to be able to find synergies in our policy work and our mandates with other committees, because otherwise we're just doing a disservice to go and see to work continue in silos. Thank you. As no one else is rising, I'll invite Deputy Carapel to place his third and final question to the President. Deputy Carapel, please. Thank you, sir. So the primary focus of the previous committee was education, which meant the committee weren't able to apply sufficient political oversight to the arts. Can the President tell me, please, what measures will the committee be putting in place to ensure sufficient political oversight is applied to the arts during their term of office. Deputy Dudley, I to reply. So, as Deputy Carapal was a member of the previous assembly, and in fact a member of the committee for a short time, it is a little disappointing that his question overlooks the work of the previous term and the strides made beyond education. My committee has inherited from its predecessors the state's approved sports strategy, an upgraded world-class athletics track at Foots Lane, a cleared and renewed focus on our language, and there has been also significant development of some of our major heritage sites, included, including much needed maintenance and redevelopment work at Castle Cornet. But of course, there is always more that could, and some might say should have been done. I mentioned a moment ago that the new committee has only met once, but we have already agreed, given the breadth of our mandate, to strengthen our numbers with two non-voting members. This will ensure that all areas of our mandate receive the attention they deserve and will also ensure that the committee is not so overstretched that it inadvertently overlooks any part of its mandated responsibilities. We've already invited expressions of interest for these two roles. Once we've appointed the whole committee, including its non-voting members, the committee will consider in accordance with rule 452 whether and to whom it will designate responsibility as the lead member for specific areas falling under our mandate and of course this will include identifying the right person amongst us to lead the committee's work on the arts supplementary question deputy carapel sure thank you so the president didn't actually answer the question i asked um, instead she, uh, she cited two initiatives that relate to sport and two that relate to culture and heritage she also said that she was disappointed in my asking the question because i was a member of the esc for a short time in the previous assembly i was indeed a member of esc uh, for a short time a mere two weeks in fact during which the committee had one meeting and the item on the agenda was to discuss whether we will resign or not uh, very little else was discussed, as I recall, uh, and a short time later we did resign. I was surprised to hear the committee will soon be identifying the right person to lead on the arts. I would have expected the president to have already done that herself when she chose the members for her committee. So can she tell me, please, why she didn't identify that person? And also, what criteria did she employ when deciding on those members? Two questions once again. Deputy Dudley Owen to reply to, please. Sir, thank you. I'll do my best uh, because I didn't manage to extrapolate two questions from that statement that uh, Deputy Carapon made, but I did get the last bit, so maybe I'll have to ask for him to repeat the, the first one. Um, the criteria that I applied to committee, uh, to uh, members who put themselves forward and expressed an interest, was about the overall view of strategy and vision for the entire mandate of the committee. Um, given that we have some very important areas to work on and policy development to work on and to deliver a model of secondary education, I needed to be sure that members who were working with me on committee would be looking at the horizon and not looking just at the mountains ahead of us that we had to climb. So it was very much a broad brush generalist approach that I was looking for, um, but general interest in all areas of the mandate. And I'm afraid um, I'm going to have to ask for um, the bailiff's help uh, to answer the first question. Deputy Carapel, what was the first part of that question? It was, uh, can you just repeat the end of your question, please? Yes, sir. Um, can the president tell me, please, why she didn't identify that person yeah. to lead the arts? Why, why was there no identification when you were choosing people to nominate Deputy Dudley Owen? Because the mandate, uh, Deputy Carapal, is so broad that um, we have had expressions of interest from all of the members ar around uh, 
specific areas of the mandate um, and to choose a person based on one slim area of interest in the committee whose, whose mandate is so large and diverse, I think would do the whole committee a disservice. So we all have an interest. I have a very great interest in the arts, but I also have an interest in language and, and sports and, and all areas. But to identify a, a committee champion at this point um, would be a little bit premature, given that we haven't either got uh, two, our additional two non-voting members. We now move on to the final question in question time, and that is to be put by Deputy Saint-Pierre to the President of the Policy and Resources Committee. Deputy Saint-Pierre, please. Sir, as a result of the mediated settlement around the changes to the States of Guernsey Pension Scheme, it was agreed to set up an independent pay review mechanism to periodically review and to make recommendations regarding adjustments in the pay for Guernsey's judges and Crown officers. The new system of pay review is not operative in time to consider pay adjustments for 2019 and thereafter. Any increase for their Jersey counterparts will be applied in Guernsey. Jersey carried out a review of judicial pay in 2019 and there's been a significant increase in the levels of pay for the Jersey bailiff and deputy bailiff. To continue, parity with Jersey will be costly. Whilst the review was delayed because of the pandemic, it is imperative that the independent pay review mechanism is operative without delay to ensure Guernsey's pay rates for these groups are set having regard to the Guernsey context. In the interests of all parties, what action has the Policy and Resources Committee taken or will it now take and on what time frame to ensure the independent pay review mechanism is established and operative without delay? For the President of the Committee, Deputy Fairbrush, to reply, please. Thank you, sir. The importance of fulfilling the outcome of this uh, to this mediation <coughs> session which reference making provision for an independent advisory panel for periodic review and make recommendations regarding adjustments in the pay of the Guernsey judges and Crown officers is fully acknowledged. Prior to the onset of the COVID emergency response, research had begun. However, as Deputy St. Pierre is referencing his question, that review was placed on hold to enable the uh, reprioritisation of resources and also because of the prevailing situation made it a challenge to develop that work until now. That said, I'm pleased to report that the research work is due to be presented to the Policy and Resources Committee during this month in order to provide direction to officers. It is anticipated, therefore, that progress on this matter will be made before the end of 2020. Supplementary question, Deputy Sampier. So, yes, the remuneration of the Lieutenant Governor is currently linked by formula to that of the bailiff. Now, does it remain the intention of the present uh, committee with effect from the next Lieutenant Governor to remove the exemption from income tax? Uh, which currently applies to the appointee's remuneration uh, and does the the, 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 the exemption from income tax um, and uh, but but therefore also be necessary for the committee to ensure that the level of remuneration should be competitive for the role whether determined by an independent pay review mechanism or otherwise deputy Furbrush, can you answer both of those supplementary questions uh, please i believe i can sir the uh, there is no current attempt to change the uh, uh, income tax provision in relation to the office of the Lieutenant Governor uh, and uh, the matter, the, the linkage between uh, the Lieutenant Governor's uh, salary and that of the uh, of the uh, will be Deputy Trot, sir. So, thank you, sir. But does it remain the intention of the present Policy and Resources Committee to extend in time any independent pay review mechanism to all senior appointments? Deputy Fairbrush, are you able to answer that question? I don't think I have in full detail, sir, because what the question, what Deputy Sapir's initial question was, was reference to the mediation, et cetera. And so, in relation to that, we say, I can't ignore the fact I've been a lawyer a very long time. Once you have a settlement for mediation, you have to honour it. It becomes a legal obligation. I've only been president of policy resources now for a few weeks. This matter has been on issue now for a very long time. All I would say is that I'm surprised that the previous policy resources committee didn't resolve that uh, in post haste and also didn't ensure that those people who are legally entitled to their full salary didn't receive it. And the answer to the question, sir? Deb De Deputy Gollop, supplementary question. Yes, would would the president agree that there is a <clears throat> there is a, a, a contradiction between uh, ensuring the best possible candidates are paid the the appropriate market rate for their professional services and the need to contain states' expenditure uh, on senior figures 
uh, and therefore will that mean that, that a wider report is needed on, on the on public service sector remuneration? Deputy Furbrush to reply. Well, it may be, but in relation to this specific, and I'm sorry that Deputy Trump did not answer to this question, I really did, but uh, he and I may disagree, I'm not so much straightforward. But in relation to that matter, uh, in relation to that matter, and Deputy Bob's question, there may well be a review, but uh, the fact is, in relation to this specific issue, it's been explained why that review didn't take place. The legal position is that the uh, judges and their Crown officers are entitled to parity with their Jersey colleagues, uh, and that's been, I think, now that should have been addressed 10 or 11 months ago. Uh, there will be a review in relation to the position going forward, as I've already indicated in my written answer to Deputy St. Pierre's question. As to the wider public service remuneration review, that's not an issue that I can give a, 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 an off the cuff answer. And I think that means, Deputy Trot, that they'll be looked into and a written response uh, provided in due course. Indeed. Yes, sir. That was the right response, yeah. rather than. Yeah. Deputy Fowler. Sir, Deputy Furbrush has said that progress will be made before the end of 2020. Uh, more importantly, can Deputy Furbrush indicate when the matter will be concluded? And if he cannot prior to PNR considering the matter during November, as he says it will. Will he please give an undertaking to advise members in writing following that meeting when the committee does anticipate that the matter will be concluded? Deputy Furbrush? I think what I would be prepared to do, uh, and of course uh, I'm one member of five, but my own view is that I would be prepared, subject to my colleagues agreeing it, to give an undertaking that to report back after the end of the year if the matter is not fully resolved at the, by the end of the year. No one else is rising to ask any further supplementary questions and therefore that will conclude question time. Uh, members of the states, I'll take this opportunity just to remind you of the uh, rules relating to supplementary questions. No member may ask more than two supplementary questions in respect of each principal question's answer. And that is why where members choose to double up their questions in a single contribution, I'm saying that that's going to be treated as two questions. It makes it difficult for the president who is uh, answering the question if that happens. And therefore, I would encourage members when getting to their feet to ask supplementary questions to try and formulate them as clearly as possible. So there's a question, answer, and then another question and an answer. Um, the other thing that I'm being encouraged to remind you is that when you leap to your feet and you are called, please can you put your microphones on? Uh, I think there's been some variable uh, switching on and switching off of microphones during the course of the, of the morning and therefore uh, your pearls of wisdom uh, are not necessarily being received loudly and clearly uh, elsewhere. Griffier. Be aided to 24, Article 1, Scrutiny Management Committee, election of members of the Scrutiny Management Committee. Can I invite first the President of the Scrutiny Management Committee to move any nominations she wishes to? Deputy Burford. Thank you, sir. Yes, I would like to nominate Miss Grace Ruddy and Mr John Whittle. Are those seconded? Uh, could I please second both of those nominations? Thank you, Deputy Dyke. Are there any other nominations? Well, members of the States, I'm going to put you simply the nomination, therefore, by the President of the Committee, Deputy Burford, seconded by Deputy Dyke, of uh, two voting members of the Scrutiny Management Committee who are not members of the States. They are Grace Ruddy and John Whittle, and you should have received uh, copies of information in relation to them. Uh, I'll put both of them to you together. Those in favour and those against. I declare both uh, of those candidates duly elected as members of the Scrutiny Management Committee. The following legislation is laid before the states. Yes. Number 77 of 2020, the Emergency Powers Coronavirus General Provision Bailiwick Guernsey, Number 5 Amendment, Number 2 Regulations 2020. 
number 84 of 2020, the Emergency Powers Coronavirus, General Provision, Bailiwick Guernsey, number 6 Regulations 2020. Number 94 of 2020, the Emergency Powers Coronavirus, General Provision, Bailiwick Guernsey, number 6 Amendment Regulations 2020. And number 101 of 2020, the Emergency Powers Coronavirus General Provision Bailiwick of Guernsey Number no. 7 Regulations 2020. And members of the States, we note that all of those four measures have been duly laid before the States of Deliberation today. I've not received any motions, perhaps unsurprisingly, to annul those regulations, uh, but there is an opportunity if you wish to do so at the next meeting. Next item of business. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, proposition laid pursuant to Rule 18 of the Rules of Procedure. Civil Contingencies Authority, Emergency Powers, Coronavirus, General Provisions, Bailiwick of Guernsey, Number 8 Regulations, 2020. And I invite the Chairman of the Authority, Deputy Furbrush, to open debate on this matter. Deputy Furbrush, please. I'm very grateful, and I'm very grateful to members. And because uh, we are a new Civil Contingencies uh, Authority in the sense that the uh, presidents of the four committees that comprise their are all new presidents, so we're very grateful uh, that Deputy Salisbury uh, is remaining as uh, the Chief Deputy Chief Minister and she uh, will see the she, she can contribute and she has contributed value. And also to our colleagues in Albany and Saar who are also uh, valuable members of the authority uh, to outline that's just where we are in relation to uh, the Civil Contingencies Authority. Now the Civil Contingencies Authority was set up pursuant to the Civil Contingencies Bailiff of Guernsey Law 2012. And it can only act if there is an emergency. And there's a definition of an emergency in Section 2.1 of the law. Now, the relevant emergency that COVID is acting there under is under Section 2.1a, which says that uh, it defines emergency as meaning an event or situation which threatens serious. Thank you. They have having reminded everybody to put their microphone on. Of course, I failed at the first, so I apologise for that. Anyway, Section 2.1 defines emergency as meaning an eventual situation which threatens serious damage to human welfare or the environment in the bailiwick or any part thereof. And then in relation to that particular part, subsection 2.1a, uh, there's a definition under section 2.2, which says for the purposes of subsection 1a, an event or situation threatens damage to human welfare only if it involves causes or may cause loss of human life, human illness or injury, homelessness, damage to property, disruption of the supply of water, food, etc., etc., disruption of a system of communication, disruption of facility for transport, or disruption of services relating to health. Now, clearly, uh, there could be no argument uh, that uh, what we are dealing with in relation to the pandemic falls squarely within the provisions of that section. But you don't need to be a lawyer or to read that definition, because if you are asked to ask Mr. Smith in Fort George, the famous Mrs. LePage from Torteville, or even uh, Peter Furbrush, formerly of Millmount, Shirottery, St. Peterport, whether this was an emergency or not, they would all tell you that it is. And so, therefore, it's been necessary for regulations to be made thereunder. And this particular regulation is the eighth in that list. Now, of course, it is a draconian uh, power in relation to making regulations. As my predecessor, as chairman of the authority, said publicly previously, when he became uh, chair of the authority and the president of uh, policy and resources, he never expected during his tenure of office to have to, to, to be involved in making regulations of this nature, which do restrict civil liberty. I'm in exactly the same position. Nobody welcomes or, uh, or likes this particular role in the 21st century restricting in an open, uh, liberal, democratic, decent society such as ours, the making of these regulations. But of necessity, they've had to be made. And section 16 of the same law uh, refers to the fact that these are emergency regulations and the obligation statutory under the or by the authorities that they should be laid before the states as soon as is reasonably practical after being made. And they lapse under section 16.2 of the law at the end of the period of seven days within the date of laying unless a during that period of time a proposition is put before the states to approve the regulation and which if it not carried the regulations lapse immediately or the states pass a resolution approving them so that's what we're here today to ask the states to pass a resolution approving them now my rate my reading of the, the law is that these regulations can be amended because under section 16 5 the states can pass a resolution that emergency regulations shall have effect with a specified amendment 
the regulation shall have effect as amended with effect from, and that's effectively the date of the amendment. So they could be amended, but in this particular instance, they are proportionate. Now, we are also obliged under the provisions of the law, and we receive them, we have received very clear and able and concise advice uh, from the procurer and the, con the controller that the making of the regulations must be proportionate. And we're mandated, and there are certain issues that we have to have regard to pursuant to the statute in deciding that. Now, we've been given that advice. We were given that advice on the day that we made that uh, these regulations, which is the 29th of October, effective from the 30th of October. So we were very clearly given that advice. Uh, it, uh, it could have been given with greater clarity. So in relation to that, as a, there's also perhaps the other statutory provision I should uh, mention is section uh, 20 of the law, which does provide that if the regulations are made, then the penalties upon anybody who breaches those regulations are very severe, including a heavy fine and or imprisonment. So they have to be taken seriously. Now, I don't think I need to say much more than that, except in relation to these regulations, they have been carefully considered. They were taken after able legal medical uh, advice, uh, and we believe uh, unanimously as the authority that there's something that we can proportionally put before this assembly and ask this assembly to make. They only last for a period of 30 days from the time of laying, uh, and therefore they, they need to be come back regularly before the assembly, either for approval, amendment, or repeal. Deputy Sam here. Um, so I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to anybody in the assembly that I, of course, wholeheartedly uh, endorse these uh, regulations as being both essential and, as Deputy Fairbrush has said, uh, proportionate uh, for the ongoing management of the island's response to the pandemic. I do, however, uh, wish to take this opportunity to raise two points which I'd like Deputy Fairbrush to respond to at the end of the debate, and I have given him advance notice of the questions I will raise. Um, so part one of these regulations, of course, sits at the heart of our strategy for managing and mitigating the pandemic, and, and Deputy Fairbrush referred to that. Uh, it is the part which effectively imposes the border controls which are so critical to the strategy by giving the requisite powers to require testing and self-isolation. Uh, in relation to travel, we of course moved into phase 5C last week, and this relies on deploying the testing and self-isolation powers at different levels, depending on the prevalence of the virus at a rate of X per 100,000 in the point of origin of the traveller. And of course, the determination of where X sits is a political decision. Uh, setting X higher lowers our risks, setting X lower raises them. And that political decision has, and, and I'm, I'm sure will continue to be made by the authority, having regard to the modelling undertaken by the public health team of the level of risk to the community as X is either dialed up or down. Um, as the pandemic um, continued to escalate outside the island, uh, the outgoing authority, uh, which I chaired, adopted a lower risk appetite, and the new authority, absolutely correctly in my view, has not sought to tamper with that decision. However, as the prevalence rate peaks and declines in travellers' points of origin, the determination of our risk appetite at that point will be key. Uh, in light of this, uh, and this is the question for Deputy Fairbrush when he responds to the debate, could he confirm that the authority will consider publishing, uh, and I must emphasise, in an appropriate format, in an appropriate format, the modelling underpinning the determination of X, as it is that information which will enable this assembly to effectively scrutinise the future decisions of the authority and, of course, potentially amend the regulations as uh, Deputy Fairbrush has set out. Uh, sir, secondly, as members know, the Civil Contingency Authority provides, as Deputy Fairbrush has said, that these, the authority can make regulations for up to 30 days. As we roll into the eighth set of general regulations today, and with no end in, uh, to the pandemic in sight for months ahead, the authority is going to need to keep remaking these regulations on more occasions. And whilst it is obvious that the emergency conditions of the law continue to be met and the powers are still needed, this extended use of the law uh, is, I would suggest, almost certainly beyond the scope of our predecessors' expectations when they prepared the law and approved it. Uh, it is also unsatisfactory from this Assembly's perspective in that the regulations can only be approved, uh, or, of course, um, they, they can be amended, as Deputy Fairbrush has said, um, or, or they, of course, lapse in their entirety. Uh, and this latter option 
um, in the event that the Assembly did not vote to approve them, would clearly be wholly inappropriate. Uh, so I think the time has now come to consider putting the contents of the regulations on a more stable legislative footing, which of course does exist in other jurisdictions, uh, recognising the ongoing need for the powers for the foreseeable future. And this of course would also enable this Assembly to properly scrutinise line by line the legislative framework that cannot uh, be done quite so effectively uh, as uh, with these regulations. Uh, and so when replying to the debate, um, again, I'd be grateful if Deputy Ferrush can confirm that it is the authority's intention to bring forward uh, policy and legislative pro proposals to create this more stable platform. Or if he's not able to confirm that, perhaps because the, 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 new, the authority hasn't had an opportunity to consider it, um, will he confirm that he will ensure that the matter is discussed at its next meeting uh, and undertake to advise members in due course of its decision. Uh, there is one further matter that I wish to comment on. In the most recent cluster of 10 cases, the index case was not clear uh, to the public. And as a result, um, the vacuum was filled by rumour that the index case was someone in self-isolation who had allowed someone else to visit them. Now, whether this is uh, or is not the case is really irrelevant um, to the point which I wish to make. Uh, other than, uh, which is really that the authority must fill the vacuum with good communication. And uh, I think you ask the question, what would that have looked like in this case? I think it would either have been confirmation that the facts were correct, and that would have served as a platform to underpin the purpose and need for the community to adhere to the rules of self-isolation, uh, or to kill the rumour, uh, one or the other. And I'd simply ask that the authority and uh, perhaps learn the lesson from that, this particular case uh, and ensure that, um, that the, the, the vacuum is filled should a similar situation arise again in the future. Deputy Trot. So communication is certainly key, as is the use of language. Uh, Deputy Fairbrush uh, used the word draconian uh, to describe these regulations. Draconian means excessively harsh and severe. In what way are these regulations excessively harsh or severe? Thank you, sir. Deputy Carapel. So, I'm going to give a clarification, please. Um, we're told in the third paragraph on page one, the regulations will lapse on November 27th. Does that mean that at our next state's debate, we'll be presented with an updated set of regulations to debate? I ask that because I'm extremely concerned that hundreds of students and islanders who spend a lot of time off island throughout the year will be expecting to return to Guernsey for the Christmas holidays. And I want to be sure that the measures that will need to be put in place to deal with that influx are robust enough to prevent a further outbreak uh, which would result in our going back into lockdown. So I appreciate clarification on that point, so thank you. Deputy De La. Sir, uh, I note that um, one of the key changes for the new Phase 5C is the introduction of testing on arrival at the airport and harbour uh, for the vast majority of arrivals into the Bailwick. With most of our neighbours in Europe and now the UK being at the highest alert and in lockdown, um, that's from tomorrow in case of UK, I would like uh, a confirmation that all visitors and essential critical workers to the island, including those traveling and making use of the business tunnel system, are tested. There should be no exceptions there. Uh, we have to be particularly even more vigilant now as the number of cases locally go up and up each day. Can I ask the CCA chairman, that's Deputy Furbrush, to declare publicly that those making use of business tunnels and the essential workers um, are tested like um, others. Thank you, sir. Deputy Gollop. Sir, I perhaps might not have used the word draconian, but I think uh, we are seeing a wider debate in America, in the United Kingdom, of parliamentarians who are concerned that, that uh, and, and jurists as well, who are concerned that 
restrictions on, on, on people's liberties is having a material effect on both their the economy and, and their psyche. And, and this makes clear that it does place restrictions and requirements on other persons and it imposes screening requirements, detention of people, requiring people to self-isolate, etc. What I wish to identify further is we see for the, the again reiterated the uh, paragraph four of the schedule, which modifies the mental health bailiwick of Guernsey law, which permits an approved medical practitioner rather than only a second opinion approved doctor to. Uh, uh, provide a certificate for the purposes of section 56 of that law where the practitioners of the opinion not reasonably practical or would involve unnecessary de delay to comply with the unmodified requirements of that section. There have been mental health review issues with this and I would like to ask whether uh, the CCA will, will actually um, uh, discuss these requirements with um, uh, the Health and Social Care Committee and see if they are having any material adverse effect on, on, on mental health practice and, and the well-being of individuals with, with those conditions. Deputy Sorsby. <laughs> on or off. Um, I thought I'd just uh, make a couple of observations and I hear what uh, Deputy Trot was saying about uh, um, uh, Deputy Fairbrush's uh, statement about draconian. I think for some individuals they might see it as draconian. I think it's clear that not everybody believes that uh, what we're doing is right but from a general population point of view which is what we're considering it's clearly that they're not, they're not considered um, for the population and, and protecting the population as a whole, that they're not considered draconian. Um, clearly, we are impacting people's human rights. And so that's something that, as, as um, uh, certainly Deputy Sampier will know, is something that we consider at every CCA meeting, that what we're doing is appropriate and proportionate to the risks that, that we are facing. And that's where we are at the moment. Um, in terms of mental health, um, Deputy Gollop, Yes, I'll give way to Deputy Trump. I'm grateful to my friend for giving way because I, I made the point about how important language is. Something cannot be excessively harsh and severe and proportionate simultaneously. It's not possible. It can, if you're looking at it from two different perspectives, either from the individual or from the population as a whole, which is something that um, people, anybody who, the, the new members of HSC, will appreciate in the decisions that have to be made. You have to balance the rights and uh, requests of the individual with what you have available and what you can do for the population as a whole. So that's, that's a constant, um, which anybody on HSC will will understand. Um, in terms of mental health, um, Deputy Collett's question is very good. Um, it's actually um, a question that I raised at CCA uh, last week and because we, it has been there for, for a while and we were I was concerned about it. Um, we got um, good advice from uh, law officers on this with, with regard to um, Bring it either we well, could do things remotely. Why don't you use a, use a panel remotely? But we're dealing with people who, in certain circumstances, due to the condition they've got, can't use. Um, they they can't work with people on the screen, and they've got particular mental health conditions that make it difficult. We haven't had to use it yet at all, which which is really good. But it's something that we're ch we're challenging all the, all the time. Um, in terms of testing uh, business tunnels, I think it's something De Deputy Delar mentioned at the uh, meeting we have the other week on um, whether we have testing with well, the business tunnels are designed for people to come in and out in a day there aren't any immediate tests that are reliable enough for us to be able to use those if, if we could critical workers are all dealt with and, and tested and every, every critical worker is looked at in terms of their risk um, certainly from um, um, the medical director analyzes the risk especially when it comes to health and, and care workers so that that is always being assessed uh, depending on the risk that critical worker. In terms of communication, um, absolutely, as Deputy Sopio well knows, it's something that we have focused on um, significantly over the last um, 
nine, ten months, however long it seems to have been years. But um, it was actually, we, we did put out um, a release on, on Monday explaining that the, the issues regarding the UK and how people um, should not worry about that. We're, we're, we're well prepared for, for the, the UK lockdown. We we're also, also going to put out something on, um, yes, the rumours, we know the rumours, but we also we wanted to be able to give more information at the time. We, I, I haven't heard the latest on where we are in terms of the, the source of the cluster, but there have been a variety of, of leads which public health have been following and we didn't want but by putting out something where we didn't know something would only would not solve that problem i'm well aware of unhelpful rumors on social media every time we've had a press conference i've, I've said and as deputy St. Pierre said please don't listen to social media just just be, be it listen to to what um the government government has to say we will tell you when, when we know we have the facts so it has been unfortunate some of the comments on, online I, I have had to, to deal with some of them but really people should be satisfied that the, that, that work is progressing and we, we of course we're not going to go out and say well it was it was joe bloggs in um down on grand Rue who, who did it we, we clearly we got to think about those that person's own rights and, and data protection so we've got to work within that that sphere as well it's not straight as straightforward to say yeah um uh, it's, it's it was this person we know what it is but but we can as much as we can we will say where we believe that source is i take it i can make my point sir well deputy delal you you know the rules as well as uh, anyone else which is if you want a member to give way you stand in your place which you did it's helpful if the member on her feet uh, might say yes or no right. when seeing somebody who's who's standing but you've already spoken so you can't be called again deputy dyke now members of the states this gives me an opportunity because uh, deputy dyke is going to be making his maiden speech just to remind members that when a member makes their maiden speech, by convention, there are no interruptions of that member making the maiden speech. Uh, and therefore, no <coughs> points of order, no points of correction, and no one standing in their place uh, seeking for the member to give way, please. So, Deputy Dyke. Uh, so, I may have mistaken the procedures. I was proposing to ask uh, Deputy Salisbury a question. Uh, well, you have misunderstood the procedures on that basis in that uh, it, it, if you wished to put a question to Deputy Salisbury while she was speaking in a debate, then you would do as Deputy Delisle did, which is to stand in your place and remain silent and hope that you can um, catch the speaker's eye uh, and uh, she might give way to you so that that point can be raised in the context of that speech. It's always open to you to make a speech but it won't be Deputy Salisbury who's able to answer that question. It would be the chairman of the authority who's leading on this debate who might be able to answer that question in any event. But if you do that, it will be your maiden speech. And that's the point that I was just trying to make. That's understood. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I don't see any other member rising. <laughs> I hope I haven't put those new members off making their maiden speeches as a result of this. We, we do encourage you to do when it's appropriate for you to do so. But I will turn to the chairman of the authority to uh, reply to the debate. Deputy Furbush, please. Well, sir, I'm very grateful to Deputy Salisbury for answering, I think in particular, uh, Deputy Gollop's question in full and dealing with Deputy Dial's point. So dealing with, and I mean, no disrespect intended, but we're probably the the least valuable of the question from Deputy Trot about the word draconian. Of course, he will know that it's got a, a, it, it, its derivation is from the Greek, Dracus, and in relation to it, it also includes, and I'm sure he knows from Shakespeare, the restriction of civil liberty. And I was referring to that in that context, because like most words, they have most, they have various definitions. And the point is, it's too important to argue semantics. We're arguing, we're talking about a restriction of civil liberty in the manifest overall benefit of the uh, bailiwick of Guernsey. Now, Deputy uh, Carable said, when will they come back? He's absolutely right. I think the inference from his question is that they will have to come back either in this form or an amended form or some other form at the next state's meeting because to keep within the 30 day period. So that will give that consideration and hopefully will give the assurance to the, uh, the community that he mentioned. Now, Deputy, Deputy uh, St. Pierre 
did, as he correctly said, gave me due notice, good notice of the uh, of the two main points that he raised. I think the third point has been dealt with by Deputy Salisbury, so I won't repeat that. But I just make a general point. Just with the previous authority, uh, which had an excellent record of communication, so will this authority. The intent is to tell people everything that can properly be said. We can't scotch all uh, room. And I know lots of people spend time, I think, on Twitter. I think they spend time on Twitter and Facebook and other things where they have obviously time to do that. And that permeates uh, and often facilitates misunderstandings. Uh, and that's completely unhelpful. Uh, people should listen to the facts. Uh, by all means, question the facts, but they should listen to the facts and make their judgments based there under. Now, his first question was about uh, the appropriate modelling, and that should be, uh, would, it, would we give a commitment, the, uh, the Civil Contingencies Authority, that we will publish that? Well, I haven't discussed it with my colleagues, but I'd be very surprised if they weren't willing to give a commitment that that shouldn't be published, as he says, in an appropriate form. But of course, S and other factors will change regularly. They'll go up, they'll go down, et cetera, et cetera. So the modelling will change. Uh, and what we don't want to have already overburdened officers and medical people having to every day look at the appropriate figure. But of course, people must be kept informed on a regular basis. Now, as to a change in the legislation, uh, there are a, a couple of comments he made that, with considerable respect to him, I don't necessarily agree. I think one of the things he said was that it was beyond the scope of those, or sort of beyond the consideration of those that um, uh, brought about this law, that uh, it would be used it would still be used in the way that it is for the foreseeable future. Well, I don't actually agree with that because I, you look at the law. It doesn't matter. It's like anything. As a, he would know as a qualified lawyer as well that when you look at the descript, when you look at the uh, way a law is interpreted, you look at the actual terms of the statute. And clearly, all the regulations, both now and any that may be made in the future, and any that were made in the past, fall squarely within the terms of the statute. There's nothing ultra virus in relation to that at all. So there's no reason why this statute cannot be used for the foreseeable future. He also said there was a stable foundation or whatever the phrase was. Well, I don't agree with him there. There was a stable foundation. There is a stable foundation to continue to use this piece of legislation. Now, we've already got overburdened public officials. And uh, in relation to the matter, it comes back before this assembly periodically, regularly, in short term. A, before any regulations can continue beyond the short term, because they have to be brought for their approval or otherwise, uh, as soon as is reasonably practical. These were made on the 29th of October. We're here now uh, on the 4th of November. And B, they can only last for a short period of time, the 30-day period from the laying of the, uh, of the or making of the original regulation. So there's pretty good control anyway. Deputy Inder was talking in a different context about uh, something about, do we want to really argue whether someone should be blue or green, a van or whatever? I, there was a van that went round, if you remember, for the uh, for the election, which had the pictures of three good-looking and one other member of the uh, state assembly, now state assembly. So in relation to that, but we don't want to be arguing about things like that. We want to be dealing with matters on a practical and proactive basis to make sure that the bailiwick is protected. And that's what we're seeking to do. So I, my best guess, and it is a best guess, is that if there was to be a new statutory uh, basis. It would probably take six months to draft and enact, even going espresso presso, going sprinting rather than uh, than ambling. And we, so, therefore, this piece of legislation is going to be used for the foreseeable future. I also don't think it would be a matter for, with great respect to my colleagues on the Civil Contingency Authority, I think it would be a matter for policy and resources because it is a policy decision to change the statute, not the civil contingency. So, I believe it would be the committee, which Deputy Salisbury and I are also members, and our other three colleagues, to initially address it, with, of course, any, any representations made by the member of the Assembly. So, my own view, and I'm expressing my own view, is that this vehicle works and will work for the foreseeable future. Because, again, what legislation would replace it? What form would that legislation take? I could see a, we had a day and a half, I'm Deputy Roffey always corrects me on the time frame, but we had a day and a half debate not to, in the last states about bonfires and matters such as those. And there were many interesting uh, speeches on that. So I can imagine a matter of civil liberties such as this, there would be a, a lengthy debate. That's not to say we shouldn't in relation to civil liberties have lengthy debates and matters shouldn't be uh, scrutinised. But what we, get on, what we need to get on with is to make sure that the bailiwick of Guernsey is protected in relation to this horrible pandemic, uh, and we've got a vehicle to do that. Thank very much. Deputy Dillard, why have you leapt to your feet? I was wanting to uh, uh, interject with, with guidance with uh, I think you've missed your opportunity, I'm afraid, Deputy Dillard. He's finished. Um, members of the States, there's a single proposition. 
and that is whether you're minded to approve the emergency powers coronavirus general provision bailiwick of guernsey number eight regulations 2020 those in favor <laughs> those against i declare that proposition duly carried The aid at R23, Article 1, Committee for Home Affairs, Amendments to the Terrorism and Crime Bailiwick Guernsey Law 2020. I turn to the President of the Committee, Deputy Proud, to open debate. Deputy Proud, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. So, I am pleased to present my first speech to the Assembly as President of the Committee for Home Affairs. You will note, sir, that the policy letter was prepared by the previous Committee for Home Affairs last term, but it was fully endorsed by the present Committee at its inaugural meeting this week. It would be not to thank the previous Committee for their commitment and hard work in ensuring at a political level this bailiwick is kept safe and secure. So I must also pay a special tribute to former Deputy Lowe for her sterling work as President last term, and indeed to her loyal and outstanding continuous service to this House and our community over the previous 26 years. Yeah. I'm sure this House will agree with me, this is a remarkable achievement. So, this policy letter recommends amendments to the Terrorism and Crime Bailiwick of Guernsey Law 2002, which is the main statute in the bailiwick relating to terrorism. The proposed amendments relate to border controls which the committee proposes are progressed for operational reasons as a priority ahead of a wider review of the bailiwick's terrorism legislation, which is currently being undertaken by the Law Officers Chambers. The recommended amendments are set out in section 3.1 of the policy letter as follows. First, new powers at the border to inspect, seize and retain travel documents. Second, extending existing terrorism related powers at the border, including powers to stop, question and detain people, to search persons, ships and aircrafts and goods to take copies of documents and to detain property, to their exercise in relation to the commission, pre preparation or instigation of hostile acts that do not fall within the definition of terrorism, being acts threatening national security, threatening the economic well-being of the British Islands and acts of serious crime. And third, supplementary updating provisions around calculating date detention periods, restrictions on the use of answers to questions and evidence, searches, the supply of information and the issue of codes of practice. So with regard to the issu issuance of codes of practice, I've been given an absolute assurance from law enforcement they fully acknowledge that proportionality is at the core of this legislation and the powers it gives officers and to the stringent safeguards in place will be adhered to. So I have mentioned the wider review. So before closing, I should draw the Assembly's attention to section 2.3 of the policy letter, which acknowledges that whilst most the most urgent matters are dealt with in this policy letter, there is a more comprehensive review underway and the consultation has taken place around the bailiwick terrorism legislation. Whilst the legislative framework is complex and there are currently huge pressures on the workload of the law of the Crown, a proportionate and appropriate policy letter will all come to this assembly as soon as practically possible. So the committee hopes that the assembly will show full support to this policy letter. Thank you, sir. Deputy Gollop. Um, like Deputy Prower, I too commend his department and also his predecessor, long-serving parliamentarian, uh, Mrs Mary Lowe, for the work that she and her team did on this. And it is a commendably short, uh, but nevertheless very interesting and important uh, policy letter. 
because unlike my sweet no I'm, 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 but the, the, what is interesting though is it's like a little master class in some of the teasing issues of being a states member and would bear great scrutiny formal and informal and i'm pleased to be a member again of the uh, scrutiny legislation panel but just but just to look at the issues paragraph 2 2.1 it, in 2006, the states resolved to prepare legislation to update the 2002 law. Much drafting work to that end was undertaken, but then the UK regime was significantly modified further. So actually what this is, it, it reveals uh, an outstanding re resolution from 14 and a half years ago. So that's issue number one, because it was never fully completed. Issue number two, there's a further outstanding state's resolution from 2013 mandating the preparation of legislation equivalent to the provisions of Schedule 7 of the 2008 relating to terrorist financing, money laundering and weapons proliferation. Well, I'm aware that previous policy and resources committee, especially Deputy um, um, Trot and Deputy St. Pierre were very focused on ensuring we had a robust regime to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. But nevertheless, I wasn't aware that there was apparently this legislative, um, not black hole exactly, but the gap that needed to be uh, filled. And, and then paragraph 2.3 says that the Bailiwick's terrorism legislation needs to be looked at in the round and that the relevant outstanding resolutions are now out of date. So we're having a broad review. Now this broad review will obviously be time consuming and sometimes I think that, that we, we, we already have a lot of armoury, a lot of legislation that we can use to target totally unacceptable behaviour and practices and, and that it, it, we almost, it, it, it replicates the philosophy made by a former Prime Minister UK, uh, Mr Tony Blair, who always would say the answer to every problem is yet another new law, where sometimes we actually have the tools in our toolbox and we're using them better than most jurisdictions. And then we get into the committee notes, a major undertaking has to be managed with work pressures. It's clearly important provisions here are proportionate and appropriate to the bailiwick. Now that almost is a contradiction because part of this suggests we need to have identical for both international and security reasons proposals to the UK 2008 and subsequent revisions. But this indicates that because we're a small place that's virtually crime free hopefully, we can have a more proportionate a possibly relaxed uh, attitude. So I'm not entirely sure quite how rigorous this will be. And then, of course, we have on uh, requirements for an amendment ordinance, we have these, well, Deputy Trott might object to the word draconian because we wish to, 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 to stop uh, anybody of, of questionable uh, intent. But new powers at the border to inspect, seize and retain travel documents. Uh, stop and question detain people to search Persian ships and so on. Now, I didn't know those powers didn't exist because they do in other contexts. Uh, I, 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 but we need to ensure that there are, are potential appeals from that process and that they're not misused. I've no reason to believe they are misused. But an example given was the extraordinary spy story of, of two. two, two, two uh, uh, a gentleman from Russia who went to Salisbury and how counter-terrorism border, the two suspected offenders in the Scripple, Scripple case had been stopped on their arrival. It was the landing card that prevented the link. So it, it described the seeing nationals from hostile states whose behaviour is of concern. The introduction of these changes will enable them to better determine the visit of their bailiwick owners. Well, even when I was young and coming back from university on the old, uh, what was it, Havilet boat or Corbiere, I used to get stopped by officials who thought I was a suspicious character and wanted me to sign a, a declaration of terrorism as if I was connected with, at that time, Ireland or somewhere. So. 40 years ago, we had rigorous border and security people. We, we always have. So I kind of wonder, is all of this legislation exactly necessary? And if it is, why haven't we got on with it sooner? Deputy Delisle. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, 
I'm pleased to note that proportionality is at the core of this uh, legislation and the, of course, the full legislation that's going to follow and um, the, the, the powers it gives officers. Um, because it's really in the delivery uh, that a jurisdiction can falter with regard to um, uh, these powers and perhaps overuse of them. Um, but on the other hand, security and safety is absolutely paramount to our island Guernsey. And I worry about that very often. In fact, we're, you know, we're very open as an island um, uh, to uh, outsiders. And I think we have to be particularly uh, careful. And I noted that the Guernsey laws um, have been delayed by the need of the um, coronavirus legislation. But that really should not have prevented um, an area like this in terms of security and safety of this island uh, to be uh, delayed to any uh, uh, degree and to, to any extent. Um, so from my point of view, I fully support what is proposed here. It's a pity we didn't have the full package at this time because um, uh, I'd feel more comfortable with the full package, uh, but um, uh, amendments to the law uh, must be made on an urgent basis uh, for operational reasons and for the safety and security of islanders. Thank you, sir. Well, as no one else is rising, I'll turn to the President of the Committee, Deputy Prow, to reply to the debate. Deputy Prow, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, th I thank both uh, Deputy Scollop and Deputy uh, De De Lyle for their contribution uh, to the debate. If I can per perhaps um, start in re reverse order. Uh, in particular, I thank Deputy De Lyle for his, his support. He's absolutely right. Keeping the island safe and secure from these types of risks are absolutely paramount. Uh, and uh, I perhaps could draw attention in the policy le letter uh, without, without, I'm sure everybody's read it, to section 3.2, which does outline a specific risk um, that this legislation seeks to, to address. The, um, this has been much publicised. Uh, it's been subject to documentaries uh, on, on, on television, so I think we're all, we're, we're all well, well, well aware. Um, as far as uh, the, the question of, of delay, um, I think that ties into one of, one of the points that um, Deputy Gollop has, has made. And perhaps to give some assurance, if you look at, at section 2.3 of the policy letter, it makes it an absolutely clear that th this review is, has been underway for some time. And the point is that um, some of the pressures um, brought about by, by COVID uh, and by the Brexit piece, does put a huge, huge burden on uh, not only the law officers, but our, 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 our professionals. So um, that is a fact that we can't avoid, but there is a commitment and we have set it out and Deputy Gollop has referred to the relevant sections. Um, we set, it is set out in the policy letter what needs to be done. And um, I can assure this assembly uh, working with the law officers of the Crown, we will bring back the necessary le legislation to this assembly as soon as, as soon as we po possibly can. Um, I, I think it's uh, um, it may well be t timely to perhaps <laughs> remind the, the, the House that the incidents of terrorism are ongoing, although um, not an act of terrorism that is specifically related to the legislation we have before us. Um, there, have, there have been terrorist uh, uh, outrages uh, in France and in Austria uh, late, lately. And perhaps it, 
would be time you to, for, for me to update the ha house to say that um, having spoken to the uh, head of law enforcement uh, this morning, that the threat, threat level has been raised um, ar around the, the volume and severity of the recent attacks in mainland Europe, and no specific high, high, heightened risk for Guernsey other than close watch on aviation ferries and, and private tra traffic. The attacks appear to be low, lone wolf attacks rather than co-related. So that's um, the information that I was given this morning from our head, head of law enforcement, which does uh, endorse the fact that um, those threats and the threats that are specific, uh, specifically outlined in this po uh, policy letter do exist and we need to legislate as, as soon as we can. So I commend the, the policy letter to this House. Thank you, sir. Members of the States, there are two propositions. I propose to put both of them to you together. Au revoir. Uh, those in favour? Oh. And those against? I declare both propositions duly carried. Article 2, Policy and Resources Committee, Matrimonial Causes, Guernsey, Amendment Law 2019, Commencement Ordinance. And is there anything you wish to say, Deputy Furbrush, as the President of the Committee on this? No, sir. Does any member wish to speak in debate? In that case, members, I'll put to you simply the proposition as to whether you're minded to approve this draft ordinance. Those in favour? Oh. And those against? I declare that duly carried. Article 3, Committee for Home Affairs, Independent Monitoring Panel, Notification of Resignation. And I invite the President of the Committee, Deputy Prow, to open debate if he wishes. Thank you, sir. The Committee of Hope for Home Affairs would look to, like to put on record the Committee's thanks to Mrs Mead for the last 13 years she has de dedicated to the panel, both as an ordinary mem member and, and as chair. The committee is most grateful to the um, independent mon monitoring pan panel members, who are all volunteers drawn from the local community. In carrying out this, this role, they make a significant contribution that, that not only ensures that prisoners' concerns are taken into consideration during their sentence, but can also have an impact on prison operations. The committee is always keen to hear from members of the community who may be interested in joining the panel and undertaking this important role on behalf of, of the community. I urge any interested persons to contact the, the Office of the Committee for Home Affairs. That's all I need to say, I think, sir. Thank you, sir. I don't see anyone rising to speak in debate on this matter, and therefore I'll simply put the proposition to you to note the resignation of Mrs Mead. All those in favour? Anyone against? I declare that proposition duly carried. Article 4, Policy and Resources Committee, revision of the double taxation agreement, double taxation arrangements made with Finland. I invite the President of the Committee, Deputy Furbrush, to open debate. Well, sir, I don't propose to say anything other than, I believe it's self-explanatory in the policy letter, we're following on from our predecessors, and I, uh, their work is good and succinct, and I ask members to uh, uh, to make the, to give the declarations that are sought. Deputy Gollop. So I wish we could have debates on this in a way, um, because in the last states we're quite interested in ba base erosion and profit sharing issues, and I think I, 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 I was intrigued as to how this came before us through the Policy and Resources Committee, and whether it, it was it was. Uh, it was a desire from high net worth individuals or private sector entities or companies or whether it was the, the European Union or Finland itself. Because, because much as I support double taxation agreements and their furthering, there is a slight warning in paragraph 1.3. It says, in recent years, the Organisation for Economic Development and Cooperation, OECD, has been developing the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting BEPS initiative, which is aimed at combating tax avoidance. One outcome of the BEPS initiative was the creation of a multilateral instrument which committed jurisdictions could sign. Once the provisions of the multilateral instrument are adopted into domestic legislation, all, all DTAs affected by the multilateral are revised accordingly. Uh, 
And the point then made late, late, later on um, that, uh, that, that, oh, where was it? That effectively, uh, BEP, yes, uh, BEPS has revised the, 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 the context in, in, in as much that people are, uh, the, 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 that the uh, former, uh, that the nature of electronic transactions and the nature of, of changing uh, rules have indicated that we uh, uh, that we need uh, that, that, that that one needs um, modernisation of this. Um, in an increasingly interconnected world, national tax laws, many of which have their origins over 100 years ago, paragraph 1.6, have not always kept pace with global corporations, fluid movement of capital, and more recently, which can undermine the fairness and integrity of tax systems. Now, whilst accepting that uh, and the need for double tax, what we don't wish to do is to do is to do double taxation agreements, which in any way disadvantages our, our customer offering or, or our competitiveness as a jurisdiction, uh, because clearly we need to robustly argue for the, the, the strengthening of, of our place in the international world. So I think perhaps we need more information on, on, on the undercurrents of BEPS with these DTAs. I don't see any other member standing, so I would invite Deputy Furbrush to respond to that short debate, please. Well, sir, I don't see any disadvantage at all. The whole idea of double taxation agreements is that you make the taxation world uh, fairer and fuller and more proactive. And we've got more now than we ever have. Uh, again, when I first came back, there were very few, and uh, Deputy Trump had opened up some very well over the period his tenure. Um, all this is doing is updating an agreement with Finland. That's all it's doing. Uh, and uh, we've also got, I know we talk about tax agreements, but we've got the tax Guarantee law 1975, which has been amended about 214 times, I think, over the last time. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, got, it's always had a general anti avoidance provision, which the administrator, or whatever he or she would have made around the court, could implement in an appropriate circumstance. So there are various factors. So I don't see this as a disadvantage at all. In fact, it shows we're part of a Again, I forgot. Five times, but I forgot about that. Uh, I'm not very good with technology. Uh, the, uh, but in relation to, to that, we're in a position whereby we're part of the international tax community. Our whole reputation is based upon us being open, decent, balanced, and cooperative. And this is all this does. Well, members of the states, there's a single proposition. Uh, inviting you to declare as it's shown there. Those in favour? Those against? I declare that proposition duly carried. Now it's just 12.30 and normally we would leap to a, our feet and adjourn till 2.30 but there's only one item of business left to deal with members of the states. So I'm going to propose to you that we deal with that item of business so that we don't have to come back this afternoon. I'm going to remind you that the media are being invited in uh, at the close of this morning session, the close of the sitting, to take some library footage and library photographs. If you uh, want to be in that, then you'll have to stay in your place. And then I'm also going to remind you that there is the extraordinary meeting of the uh, general meeting of the branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, which needs to uh, refresh its executive committee that will follow as soon as possible thereafter, where we need to be quiet. So the motion is that we continue to finish the business uh, of this meeting now. Those in favour? Those against? And I'll declare that Julie Carrick. Greffier, last item, please. Pied de Tar 24, Article 5, Policy and Resources Committee, schedule for future states business. And is there anything you need to say in respect of that, Deputy Furbrush, as the President? No, sir. I have not received any amendments on it, and I will simply put the proposition to approve the schedule for the next meeting in three weeks' time to you. Uh, those in favour? Oh. Those against? I declare that proposition duly carried, and can I thank you for the speed with which we've dispatched the business of this meeting. Long may it last during this term. I, I will now invite the greffier to close this meeting with the grace, please.
et la grâce de notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ et la direction de Dieu et la communication du Saint-Esprit soit avec nous tous éternellement. Amen. Amen.